This is Steve Weiner. I used to write for The David Letterman Show. This is Mike Chisholm, who spent an entire life dreaming of being on The David Letterman Show and will never happen. Watch his podca podcast instead. La, 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 la. Welcome once again to The Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Today's episode is one I have been hoping for for a very long time. And if my exuberance uh, is too much for you, I apologize. I am just so excited to have John Beckerman on today. This is one of those ones where uh, there are some uh, uh, very cool things that have come into play to make this thing happen. I wanted John on this time last year. Uh, John was filming a project in England that uh, you know we talk about in this mammoth episode, gigantic episode, uh, and uh, and he was there. And the and the thought was always, okay, you know what? When I get back. Uh, well, I'll come on the show at that point at that, you know, when that happened, uh, timing was off a little bit and we, we, we didn't have him on at that point. And then fast forward to, um, a couple of weeks ago on the official Letterman channel, John Beckerman's staff favorite moments, uh, uh, segment came out and it was fantastic. So good. I highly recommend, of course, after watching this episode or listening to this episode, um, you go to the YouTube channel, the official Letterman YouTube channel. And you ha uh, have a gander at John Beckerman's staff favorite moment. It's so cool because not only is it chocked full of amazing Letterman memories, there's a lot of heart in this one. He is, the way that John approached his staff favorite moments segment was beautiful because the way he approached it was he was going to talk about relationships that he got um, and, and was a part of when he was uh, employed by David Letterman and company. So what did John Beckerman do there? Well, he was a writer, of course, uh, became head writer. We have a great conversation about that in this episode. And I just love uh, looking back on things with the, you know, the benefit of hindsight, hindsight being 2020, looking at things, where is your sweet spot? You're trying new things. Uh, what, are they going, are those new things going as well as the things that you know already? And, and John, talks a lot about the growth that he has had. We go almost three hours for this thing. And like he said, we almost, at the end of it, we felt like we just barely scratched the surface. He's going to come back. That's fantastic. John had a fantastic career, unique career within the David Letterman uh, mythos. He was a writer, head writer. Then he went on to work for Worldwide Pants. He helped co-create, uh, helped co-create? I guess helped. No, he co-created the show Ed with Rob Burnett. And I love that show. I don't know about you. So we spend a chunk of this episode talking about Ed. Thank goodness. I've wanted to do that right from the start. And we, of course, talk to him about his hijinks, his life, the lessons that he learned with uh, his career in his during his career with David Letterman and company. And just like his staff favorites moments, he comes at this thing with a lot of vulnerability, a lot of heart, and it shows through. This is a guy... Uh, that is in many ways the opposite of me, chief being. He see, thinks before he speaks. A clearly brilliant mind, product of Harvard, uh, the Lampoon. Uh, John's one of those guys. Uh, we talk a lot about that. And and I, one thing I really appreciate about him, not just his heart for you know the relationships that he built, and that's that's how he built his memories for his segment, but also just you can really really feel the thoughtfulness when he speaks, and uh, the authenticity as well. And I really appreciate that about John. It's funny. I, I'm not disappointed by any of these things, but there are some times where I have really high expectations for how a conversation is going to go. This one here, the expectations were really high. And the the, the actual blew it out of the water. Uh, we hope very much that this will not be the last time that John Beckerman is on the Letterman podcast. Uh, and and, and uh, we'll be able to do some really fun things moving forward. You will see and hear with this episode, the door is most certainly open for those, those things. There's a whole bunch of uh, creative ideas we could get from this. And uh, it, it's a lot of fun and really, really grateful that I get to present this episode uh, to, the, to the masses out there, to those of us who love uh, David Letterman and company and the works behind it. This is a really, really important episode for this, for this thing that we're doing here that is the Letterman Podcast. There is one sponsor of the Letterman Podcast that is hello-deli.com. Rupert G., uh, if you want Late Show with David Letterman merchandise like mugs, that hat, shirts, all sorts of stuff, go to hello-deli.com 
and Rupert himself will pack and send that order to you. Buy once, buy often, buy presents for people. Tell your friends, hello delicom um, the only sponsor of the Letterman podcast. It is a genuine, genuine pleasure to present to you a very special episode. And we're not wearing that out. It's true. A very special episode of the Letterman podcast. We give you John Beckerman. John, uh, I cannot thank you enough for coming on to the Letterman podcast today. You are one of those guys that uh, has been at the very tippy top of the list for me. Uh, you and Rob, of course, because of the Letterman stuff, of because of when your tenure um, with the productions of David Letterman uh, occurred, but then yeah. also because of Ed. I'm a huge fan oh. of the show Ed. Um, my first question for you. So you're the guy. I'm the guy. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, great. Small town uh, bo bowling alley lawyer. Uh, I'm right there. But I'm, I'm your demo. Um, how many it. times a week now do you get asked if Ed is ever going to be streaming or on DVD or anything like that? Does it still happen? I know it used to happen it a lot. Happens. It still happens. Yeah. It still happens. And yeah, Rob even just uh, forwarded me something he saw. I think it was in the New York Times where uh some tv writer was asked about shows that you know are kind of where are these shows why aren't they available and one of the ones she mentioned was ed um and she did add some snarky thing like you know it well ed was sort of always the bridesmaid so i don't know if you should get your hopes up when ever seeing it and wow. um, so yeah rob and i are calling each other bridesmaid <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, I do get asked. Um, and I do think that if the show were to somehow appear on streaming, that it would attract an audience. I think people like that sort of show and there's like 80 some episodes to view. And I think, uh, if it could all be sorted out, um, yeah, it's, I'm still proud of it. And I'd, I'd love to see it have a second life, like so many other things have. That show is how I became aware of your uh, uh, aware of your name outside of uh, of Letterman because you know the created yeah. by uh, you know uh, and and seeing both of you and Rob on that show uh, your names uh, it was such a sort of point of pride for a guy who loved Letterman for so long but for so long felt like I was in some sort of an underground bunker where I would go to high yeah. school or, or or whatever and it would be like you know ten or fifteen people would exchange eye glances if we knew something on the show happened. Right. something fantastic happened on the show the night before it was it was this little club but then seeing uh you know some of the some of the some of the the, the folks go to the simpsons seeing some of the folks mm -hmm. go to and and uh, to other shows uh married to children of course kevin um but then you guys actually worldwide pants logo and and production yeah. of other shows it was such a neat thing and ed was very very special because of the quirky nature of it but yet at the same time the very high standard of quality um, you know, we can do an entire episode on Ed. I just want you to know there's a lot of love for that show. Uh, people have asked me That's about so cool. it as well. So I, you know, I, it's something I hear about occasionally, but it's, it's a long time ago now. So it's nice that anybody remembers it and has good feelings about it. Um, it was, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that show could be made today. Um, so I'm glad I got to do it when I got to do it, uh, you know, which I think owed partially to the, I guess, the quality of the script we had written, but even more so to the fact that, uh, you know, the Letterman show was, was very, uh, a very powerful thing. And we were part of that. And so the wind was blowing at our backs to do, you know, the kind of show that even at the time I think was hard to get made and today would be virtually impossible. Uh, you know, light hours as they call them, which uh, aren't really dependent on, um, you know, high stakes storytelling uh, or, you know, there's no hospital, there's no uh, murders, you know what I mean? So it's, yep. it's, it's not easy to do those. Um, and I'm, um, yeah, I'm just I'm happy looking back that we got to. I wouldn't want to do it again because it was punishingly hard. I mean, in the days of 22 episode seasons to do an hour every week, um, 
it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done. And that includes, you know, my time at Letterman at its most difficult. Um, wow. So that is saying I'm glad, something. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. I, I, uh, yeah. That is certainly saying something. And, 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 uh, you know, I'm certain that you you won't enjoy me throwing you into this category, but to me, you are in this category. I think of um, I was a big Aaron Sorkin fan, and 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 knowing how mm. hard he worked on Sports Night and West Wing and 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 all of that, uh, at West yeah. Wing particularly. You know, four seasons of that, head down, trying to get that yeah. show made, and in many ways, uh, a similar tone to Ed in 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 even though the topics were completely different, but that light hour, there was a lot of humor. Um, and, yeah. and, and following that, that balance, I, I would compare the two and he has also said very similar sentiments, trying to get an hour like that on, a, on every week. Very, very difficult. That is very telling though. You saying, cause Letterman, the breakneck speed, all of the stuff. I mean, you know, we've read the Bill Carter books, all that for you mm -hmm. to say that that was the hardest thing that you've gone through. That's quite the statement, John. Yeah, it was, it was, you know, the, uh head writer of Letterman is the second hardest thing I've done. And, um, you know, I would say uh, emotionally more difficult than, than co-running uh, Ed. But Ed, in terms of the actual amount of work, was, um, was crazy. And, you know, I think part of it, frankly, is that we were unable or unwilling or unready or some combination uh, to find a way to leverage the abilities of the writing staff we had on board for that for Ed. Um, and we ended up doing it all, you know, I won't say all, but the lion's share of it ourselves, me and Rob Burnett, and that's no way to uh, do that job and keep your, you know, keep balance. your sanity or, yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> forget about balance. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. Uh, and, you know, maybe if I were to try a, a show like that again, I'd, I'd be, I'd have a different approach, but, but we, uh, yeah, you know, he will always be my um, my buddy from the trenches, from, you know, all the things we did together. Uh, we had a very, uh, very tight bond and um, worked together very, very well for whatever reasons of temperament or, yeah. you know, that our, our abilities complemented each other in some way. Um, uh, but yeah, I I couldn't have done that show without him and wouldn't have wanted to. Um, now I'm doing things on my own and, you know, different sorts of things. But like, but yeah, that experience uh, will always be an experience that I share with him, you know, as many of the Letterman stuff, the, many of the stuff. Wow, I'm good at this. Um <laughs> You know, many, many of the pieces we worked on together over the years at Letterman. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm proud of um, of uh, the body of work that he and I did together. I uh, I'm really grateful to hear you talk about that. And it, it's funny, um, you know, in the in the in the width and breadth of, of what we've done with this show here, um, you know, how many different uh, combinations of personalities that would get together and, and, and just click and end up doing things together. Um, you know, yeah. and sometimes it was straight up writer partnerships. Like you think about Carter Bays and Craig Thomas and some of these other, the other people that came along and, and people who just found their kind of found their person that they could work with. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, I want to have Rob on the show very, very badly. I understand why, um, you know, everybody is from the, from, from, from that crew seems to be, uh, you know, a little bit hesitant, a little bit. We talked at Rupert's uh, retirement, and 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 I I was gushing about Ed, um, and so oh, sure and, and he, but he was that. like, okay, you say you want to talk about Ed, but then we'll talk about Ed, and then you'll start talking <laughs> about this stuff. Like, no, 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 no. We could do an entire episode on Ed, and I hope that we actually do one day. Maybe I have both of you on here, and we literally not one drop of letter, man. We just talk about Ed. Uh, this is a nice I little did. tease. People are happy about this. I'm gonna go back to the beginnings. You were one of the Harvard guys, but you're one of the right. the, the, the the second rounds of. Uh, third rounds of Harvard guys. I want to talk all about that. 
But before we get to that, I have it on good authority that you once almost killed yourself uh, in a shopping cart accident. Uh, is that? Oh is man! That, is that? Do I have? <laughs> do I have my info right on that? Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I believe uh, we were. <laughs> we were. I don't remember if it was during a shoot week in LA or a remotes week or whatever. You know, we did we did these shows from LA, which was super fun because I was not an LA person. I had never lived there and barely been there. And uh, it was very special to like go out and spend a couple of weeks um, shooting remotes. And then we'd come back and, you know, edit it all and get the shows ready. And then we'd go back and do the actual shows. Um, and yeah, I think I, I think I went out to some special dinner at Morton's Steakhouse with uh, with uh, Spike and Donick and Jill and uh, uh, I don't even remember who all was there, but we came out. We probably had a uh, uh, a glass or two of an adult beverage and. <laughs> there was a there was a shopping cart just sitting there and I was cajoled to climb into it which I did and they started this feels like a, a spike thing spike slash donic thing but yeah they started pushing me down the sidewalk and then the thing tipped over and I was spilled into the street where of La Cienega Boulevard full of traffic and yeah uh and live to tell the tale. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of all there is to it. But if there is a point to that story, it's that there were a few years there um, in my early 20s, because I was quite young when I first got on staff. Yep. Uh, there were several years that were really among the most fun years of my career and of my life, just because, um, you know, it was a fantastic job. Obviously, I had money, I had uh, built in friends that I, you know, quickly, pretty quickly got to know um, on staff. And, you know, some of whom today I'm still quite close with. Um, I got to travel, I got to fly first class, because uh, that's the way, you know, the guild required it. And, I got to be on TV. I got to write for TV. Uh, it was incredible, you know. Um, and because I was not yet head writer, I I could sort of also be, you know, once I was comfortable enough to know that I was of significant value to the show, I could kind of be a brat a little bit, which I wouldn't do today, but I will admit like I did at the time, just cause I was a kid, you know, and I, so I could be the one kind of with my feet up on a table, you yeah. know, like throwing out zingers. And then I became the head writer and I was like, <laughs> that all hated, ended quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I grew to understand why that person is, you know, <laughs> kind of annoying. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, for for a couple of years there, man, it was um, it was idyllic for me, even with the hours and the pressure, uh, you know, which I did feel, um, but you know, very intensely uh, uh, a lot of the time. But it, it was still just the best. Um, yeah, it was like, and you mentioned the lampoon. That was that was kind of my first experience of really finding you know, people, the cliche of like finding your people or your tribe yep. or whatever, like, yep. you know, I had had very good friends in high school, but I had always felt like, you know, it was like me and my best friend. And then we were sort of, you know, we'd come in each day and talk about, you know, we were like the freaks and geeks kids, essentially. The outlier and kids. Then, abs, abs, yeah. I know who you're talking about. And, yeah. And then when I got to, uh, Harvard was, you know, lucky enough to be able to go there and um, found a lot of other kind of nerds of the same stripe as myself. And then when I got on the Lampoon, it it was that times 10. 
Um, and, and then that persisted as I managed to become a professional writer and especially a letterman, uh, where I just, you know, after the period of time that it took me to get used to it, get the hang of it, come out of my shell, I, I -hmm. felt extremely at home there, which was fantastic for me. It was something I, I really needed at that time in my life. Oh, so, so, uh, you know, there's so many people who have come on, um, this show or spoken on other records talking about um you know you you are that next generation it's fun like like i think about regalski i think about david regalski and 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 mm-hmm. when he was at at at, at uh, college and what letterman meant to uh the folks that attended that campus at that time um you sure. know you're that next generation when you get to harvard and you start to find your tribe uh and 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 your place um, and the lampoon itself. Are you aware of the Letterman lineage at that point? Um, are you just happy to be yeah. in the room? Okay, so you were aware right away. So you're asking like when I'm on the lampoon? Yeah, yeah. When I you know? when you when you got it, walked into your first lampoon, or had the, yeah. the occurrence to go to the lampoon? Did you know that before you even uh, entered Harvard that this is somewhere I want to go? Did you like Conan kind of discover it when you were there? Yeah, I. I mean, this sounds such a like such a privileged thing to say, but it's true. I I think the lampoon was a major reason that I chose to go to Harvard. I love I mean, hearing this. That, oh, that's that, excellent. That, yep, I, yep. It, you know, look, it, the fact is, I was a lucky kid. I you know, I grew up comfortably. Um, my parents sent me to an excellent school. I was a very academically driven kid. Yep. Um, that's the X factor. You, know, you still got to have that part. <laughs> that, that's, that's yeah. yeah. I, I, I was, I mean, I, I, there were other things I loved besides academics. I was a terrible athlete. I, you know, I did very well in classes. I loved, you know, I was a precocious reader. I, I've been, you know, that that's always been kind of my greatest pleasure. I discovered comedy. I loved TV. Um, I loved cartooning. I was a cartoonist. Uh, uh, comics, you know, all the kind of nerdy stuff you'd expect. Um, but yeah, I was, it became part of my identity. I think part of my self identity to really excel academically. I was valedictorian mm. and I managed to get into a bunch of schools and my, dad who uh passed away a year ago and who i i you know missed terribly uh drove me around we lived in pittsburgh and he drove me up to new england and we did the college tour thing and i saw all these places and i remember seeing the lampoon and and uh i think picking up an issue from a newsstand um right there in harvard square and being like you know because they have a building that's a castle like you know google it if if people haven't seen it but it's it's this incredible, ridiculous building. And it was all about comedy. And I was like, God, if that could be my college experience, that would be phenomenal. And so, so yeah. And, and, you know, and at the time I wouldn't say I was the biggest Letterman viewer in high school, just because of the hour it was on. And like I mentioned, I was a nerd and I was, you know, I was waking up at 6am every day. So I didn't see it a lot. Yeah. And it was, it was long before TiVo. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, but I, when I did see it, I, you know, I absolutely felt like probably I go as far as to say it was the first thing I had seen that I felt spoke directly to whatever sensibility I was developing as a person who loved comedy and aspired to make it. It was, you know, to the point where, and I could, I could send you this if you have any use for it. Although there's things in it that I wouldn't want to be seen by by, uh, by the general public, but I've got quite a bit um, of that stuff. So yes, uh, you're, it's <laughs> welcome to. I don't, I don't know if I've told this story uh, publicly before. I can't remember for sure. But so my best friend um, was a guy named Jonathan Zitrin, who I was best friends with from sixth grade on sixth grade was when he started going to the same school as me and we were inseparable. And, uh, 
at some point in the late in our senior year, we decided to make uh, a mockumentary um, about our school and it was called school, the movie. And he was behind oh. the camera. I was the host, which, and I am not a performer. This is not something I've ever pursued, but in this thing, I was the host <laughs> and I did it like Dave, or at least like I tried, like Dave was who I was emulating when I tried yep. to do it. And so, you know, I was walking around with a microphone and I was sort of, you know, I, I kind of was trying to, to interview people the way Dave does man on the street kind of stuff. Yep. And it was a complete like Dave impression, but it was, you know, shot on VHS and it was dumb, you know, 17 year old <laughs> me in a necktie. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the show, as much as I got to see, it was an enormous influence on me. And, you know, even there were other things that I loved, like Monty Python, for example, yep. but even that, like the, that was at the time I was watching it was, uh, you know, 15 years old or something. Yep. And Letterman was what was happening right then. Uh, and yeah, I was, I was amazed by it. Um, and so I do think all of that, again, privileged and obnoxious, but I think it played into my decision to choose Harvard over my other opportunities at the time. And uh, well, no, but what you just did, though, what you just did there <laughs> is many times the assumption that people make when they, you know, th th that would not be a surprising type of uh, attitude that, that uh -huh. people would would, would have stereotypical type attitude. Right. But but what you're saying is so charming because there's only a couple times I found anyway, there's only a couple times in one's life when you have a moment of clarity like you did when you picked up the lampoon and said, wait a mm -hmm. second this could be this, like yeah. I, this, this could be college, <laughs> you know, you know, where, where, where I'm yeah. expected to perform. I'm, I'm expected to, to, to achieve, to, to, to figure that's the next step. This could be it. And, and, and was... everything just kind of that light bulb moment. Right. And, and that is so beautiful that you had that at that age. What an incredible I... gift that the universe gave you. I, couldn't agree more and i really feel blessed to like the my path i've been very challenged at times during it but you know it's been i mean i'm i'm a lucky guy i'm a blessed and lucky guy uh you know i uh, like i said i was lucky enough to get into harvard i got there fell in with a group of friends immediately and started having the best time probably of, you know, my teenage years by a million times. Oh, wow. And, and then, you know, the lampoon has this, like everything at college and these competitive, I, I mean, at a uh, Harvard and competitive uh, schools, Yep. you can't just decide, Oh, I'm going to write for the lampoon. You have to enter a, you know, uh, a very, rigorous competition <laughs> talking about Aaron Sorkin that, that talking about Aaron talking about Aaron Sorkin you watch the social network um yes. and 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 I have heard that that they did a pretty obviously cinematic scored by Trent Reznor and and stylistic sure. but they did a pretty cool uh rendition of some of the antics that happen uh or happened uh you know we can't confirm or deny if it still happens but that these are the types of things that happen my next question was about yeah. getting into the lampoon. Can you describe that you're going into it now? I just want to kind of set that stage. You ain't yeah, just getting sure. in. You aren't just signing a sheet and pulling right. a tab off a <laughs> off a bulletin board. Right, right. Yeah. So the lampoon um, had, you know, kind of two elements. There was a social side to it. Uh, you know, it was like a club with a clubhouse um, and parties and you know dinners and a lot of hanging out. Um, and then we put on a magazine uh, five times a year. Uh, and, and the, you know, you work a lot harder getting into the Lampoon than you do once you're on the Lampoon, I would say. Um, Interesting. Uh, you had to, uh, you had to make a series of cuts, basically. And each cut required you to generate um, 
a few, a handful of pieces. And it was the first time that I had ever, uh, I, I chose to try to get on for art, I should add, because I had never written comedy before. And I thought, well, at least art is something that I have developed, uh, you know, some chops at that yep. the average person was not a cartoonist. So I'd have an edge. And so I, I thought, all right, I'll try to get on with art. Yep. And I drew a few little things that I did not spend very much time on and I didn't make it. Um, and then, you know, I think I got some decent feedback from some people, but I didn't make it. And I don't, I don't believe anybody, well, I know for a fact, no, no other freshman got on. And so that spring, um, I had a second crack at it. There were two chances to get on each year, fall and spring. And so I thought this time I have to figure out what it actually means to try to do cartooning, you know, yeah. cause I, I just never been ambitious with it before. Yep. And I think, yeah, actually one of the, I think one of the pieces that got me on staff is hanging up there. I mean, I can't get you a good shot of it, but like I, I started trying to draw these um, kind of page or two, two page long uh, pieces that were, mostly kind of autobiographical like satire of my like teenage years which yep. i think was pretty unusual for the lampoon the the pieces tended to be uh there's a certain style um th they were very cerebral and very abstract and there was pop culture parody and stuff like that but um there was not a lot of uh observational just slice of life comedy in it but that was what I took a crack at and I did um I think the piece that people liked the most that I did to get on was uh called rock and roll fantasy and it was a fairly true to life description of my uh getting into a a middle school rock band <laughs> um uh, with some other guys I knew and it was just a very kind of dry deadpan description of what that was actually like um, and then I did another one about uh, going to the mall basically and people like these pieces and they were they were the most it was a big step for me as um, a creative person because unlike the academic work I had done before, which I put a lot of effort into, mm -hmm. I had never invested hours and hours of work into a creative project before. I had simply never done it um, with the exception of school, the movie perhaps, but that we kind of <laughs> just, we kind of just winged that, you know, Oh, by the way, was like, by the way, yeah. Don just told me that he has found school, the movie and put it on his YouTube channel already. So here we go. We're there. Oh, the, uh, I don't know if it, <laughs> The problem is certain mores were were different. <laughs> um, like, no, I'm I'm not even kidding. Like, I'm I'm worried that there are things in there that could be construed as oh. as racist or sexist yeah. Yeah. or it, a uh, different time, a different filter. But that's not necessarily yeah. understood through today's filter. Um, the, yeah, the, 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 no, the, the I, neck breaks change that we have seen in our life, John, is just unbelievable. Of what was not just acceptable, but like almost encouraged versus heinous now. Uh, uh, just what we I, have seen, we've never, there's never been a generation that's seen change the way that we have in that regard. I would simply ask Don to maybe watch it before he links to it. Yeah, I, that was a joke. That was totally a joke. Just uh, talking oh. about Don Giller's prowess. I don't think it's out. <laughs> oh, oh, see, I was I wasn't into I thought you were serious because I think oh, I think way back in the day <laughs> I I believed it because I have a YouTube account and I think oh. either I or my friend who made it, I think we put it on just to share with the other because like back in the earliest days of YouTube, just because it was that a way is, of video share. That so is hilarious. I think I don't think it's possible to find through a search now that I think about it. Okay, but, okay. Um, 
I totally waylaid anyway. your story for a for a little one off oh, joke that's, about that's about okay. about the the prowess of Don. Um, but but it's I believed it. <laughs> to go back to your point, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, to go back to your point, though, um, I, I'm super curious about the hindsight. Once you get in there and you realize, mm-hmm. it, I find it fascinating that in the first semester for freshmen. Um, mm-hmm. And there's been other stories about freshmen getting onto the lampoon. Conan being, a, 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 of course, a, sure. a notable the, the the notable exception to the rule. Um, was it the fact that you know you t- and you talk about the joy of actually spending time on something this creative and and as opposed to just you know using mm-hmm. off, your off the cuff talent, uh, the the surface right. talent. Uh, right. Is there anything that was intentional about? Okay, we're not bringing any freshmen on because we're going to see which ones a uh, want in truly where it's not just a lark and be the ones who are going to take the second chance more seriously. Uh, was it that meticulously I don't thought think out? So. No. Okay. No, I think it was pretty uh, meritocratic. I, you know, I think I did not deserve to get on for the effort that I put in uh fall semester. I just, mm-hmm. I thought, Oh, well, all I have to do is show them that I can cartoon and they'll say, come on in. And, um, Excuse me. I, uh, excuse me. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no that. problem. No, I, no, no. Um, I just, yeah. Like I'm trying to say, like I, I had just, part of it was the cartooning for me was excruciating the doing of it. Um, I'm not a good craftsman as a, as an artist. And mm-hmm. so it was a very belabored process that I did not enjoy. And so, you know, I could, and I'm not even saying I'm good at it. I, like I had, a, I evolved a certain style that was kind of uh, rudimentary, but like appealing in a certain way. Sure. But it was, it was like pulling teeth to do it. And, um, and so part of it was just the stamina of telling myself, you know, I'm going to carve out several days of hours a day and I'm going to freaking do it and um use up bottles of white out and just make it happen. And, and that's what I did. And once I had chosen to do that, like, I think that was, uh, for me, that was a big moment of kind of for the first time developing a work, a work ethic for creative work, not just for, I'm going to memorize, you know, all these, you know, uh, chemistry facts and stuff. Um, yep. Well, so, and it's a, yeah. it's an incredible life lesson. Uh, you know, in hindsight, looking back at that, it's like okay, uh, those those things that we have been, um, whether it's enticed or forced to actually dig into, those are the things that actually build character that can actually mm-hmm. take you to the levels way above that. But as an eighteen year old kid or a seventeen year old kid, however old you were, you know, you 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 only learn those types of lessons through experiences like what you're talking about. Yeah, it was a learning experience, uh, and. Yeah, I feel like it was kind of the beginning of my career in a way. Um, uh, And so, yeah, I have the Lampoon to thank for kind of pushing me in that way. And then, you know, once I got in there that spring um, and found myself uh, surrounded by people who would go on to, uh, you know, gigantic careers and you know, and also just hearing legends of people who had already gone and done that. Um, it became the center of my college experience and uh, uh, just, you know, a fantastic way to spend a few years with uh, just some of the funniest, smartest, best, uh, you know, people that I, that I ever gotten to meet. Um, it was it was uh, <laughs> I'm making it sound like my life has just been one party and parade after another. But the fact is that those lampoon years, um, which were followed pretty quickly by my earliest years uh, at Letterman, um, you know, although there was a period in between when, when I was, uh, I was trying to get that Letterman job and I was doing other things, but uh, yeah, that was just a great span of years. Um, And I should mention that uh, one of the people I, the first people I met who was on the lampoon uh, was Paul Sims because he was, he kind of ran the process of the thing that happens to you when you get on the lampoon. And um, 
you know, and immediately I was like, who is this guy? Like, how does somebody this uh, just effortlessly funny and charming and, you know, cool. And, but, you know, he was like three years older than me and it was just like, Oh my God, like, I've never met anybody like this before, you know, and I'm I just, just going to jump in. I'm going to jump in real quick yeah. for our listeners and viewers. Uh, okay. So Letterman writer, of course, but then also yeah. um, uh, Larry Sanders show news radio yep. and a plethora of yep. other amazing, in my opinion, culturally significant projects. That's a guy that I very, very badly want to pick the brain of at one point. And suddenly this is, this yeah. is, but he wasn't that then. But he was the guy he, at the Lampoon two years your senior and was still right. that guy. So, uh, sorry, yeah, I, I just want to throw that in there for folks who might not necessarily correct. know who, who Paul is. Yeah, I was a freshman. He was a senior um, yeah. and, you know, one of the officers of the Lampoon and, uh, and you know, one of the funniest writers there, certainly. And, uh, you know, so I you know, when you're a kid, three years is, is, is huge. You know what yeah. I mean? And so, um, and then, yeah, he, he very quickly, uh, found his way to Letterman. Um, and when I, uh, when I came to New York, he very generously invited me to come visit him, um, at the show a couple times. So I remember, sitting in the edit room and watching him edit a remote. Um, and, you know, but the, he did a couple huge favors for me. One was, uh, so I guess the, the summer after my senior year at college, I decided to try to write a spec script, uh, which is a sample piece of writing that you write, you know, generally, in those days, it was usually of an existing show and you write it in the hope that somebody will read it and hire you to write for their show, whatever it may be. Gary Shandling did it for Sanford and Son back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Um, and I wrote an episode of Get a Life, which was not a popular show, but it was my favorite show by far. It was uh, Chris Elliott and Adam Resnick's sitcom that was really... You know, it was both a sitcom and kind of a parody of every sitcom convention that had ever existed. And mm -hmm. and at the time, I thought it was probably the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Um, Adam, uh, you know, I didn't know who Adam was at the time, but I knew that whoever was doing this show with Chris, who was maybe my favorite thing about Late Night, you know, yeah. I... I uh, you know, I was just blown away by what these guys were doing. And Paul uh, got my script to Adam Resnick. And um, I remember being in the, you know, super disgusting uh, summer rental apartment I was sharing with um, some of my Lampoon friends and, and <clears throat> excuse me, getting a call from Adam Resnick uh, telling me that, he couldn't hire me because he thought his show was about to be canceled, which in <laughs> fact it was, but that he, you know, he, he, he liked my script and, um, and I can't begin to tell you what, uh, how big a deal that was for me. Um, he is to this day, one of my biggest heroes as a writer, um, Adam is, uh, um, his pretty recent, uh, memoir kind of a book of stories uh you know true memoir stories that he wrote a couple of years ago is one of the funniest books i've ever read he's brilliant um and uh yeah in fact just to jump ahead a few years um mm -hmm. when i was a young writer at letterman and he was doing a project uh he uh, incredibly invited me to write for it and i wasn't able to do it at the time because i was i was kind of just getting started at Letterman, but, um, but I always, part of me always wishes uh, I had been able to go and do that because that guy, you know, I, I just can't praise highly enough. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, so, so Paul did that for me. 
yep. which did turn into a job. But then um, he managed to get my Letterman packet uh, seen by the right people. Uh, That's I, Steve, I probably. Was, right to Steve. Yeah, Steve and yeah. Morty. And yeah. and he he was either gone or just about gone from Letterman at that time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he was but... part of one of the big exoduses that happened, right? He was, uh, there was a couple of times early on, someone to the, um, was that the Simpsons one? Would that would be the one where folks left for the Sim Paul, around that time? I think not. I think that oh, okay. was before Paul left. Okay. Um, yeah, because I think, I think those guys um, went to the Simpsons before, possibly before Paul even got on staff. I'm not, okay. I don't want to say for sure. Don would know. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. Um, so, you know, it just goes to show you like when people talk about the lampoon mafia or the pipeline or whatever, I mean, yep. the fact is you meet people who you would not otherwise meet who are super funny, smart and talented and into comedy and end up doing these jobs. And, you know, if I had not had that experience on the lampoon, I would not be in uh, television or comedy or show business today because I, it simply wouldn't have struck me as a thing that was worth pursuing. Um, it would have seemed like something that, you know, you don't get to do just by trying. Uh, and I, I think I would have gone into academia or, um, uh, you know, something like that. Um, so there you go. That's, so, that's uh, what Harvard did for me, which was a lot. I got to say it was everything. Oh, absolutely. The trajectory was, uh, you know, very clear that this is the, the event that allowed you to enjoy your college years and also put you on the tra tra trajectory of what your future was going to be. Um, yeah. Forgive my ignorance, both on 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 the timeline of of, of Paul Levin, but more so uh, for this next question: Has there been a documentary done on the Lampoon and its alumni? And 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 if so, I haven't seen it, and I would love to see it. If not, uh, that thing needs to be made, as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's so much rich history in the world of entertainment today that is still mm -hmm. shining on uh, because of. All of the generations I've watched. I don't know if you, you got a chance to watch the uh, the five part comedy store uh, documentary that was made a couple of years ago. Um, it did actually, yeah, ab absolutely incredible. To me, um, you know, we're we're living in this world of archiving and 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 reminiscing and throwback and 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 culture shifting events and all of that. To me, a five part uh, or a three part or or something, a long form doc on the the lampoon itself and then the people who came out of it and where they are now and, and, and all of that, the culture that was made mm -hmm. in comedy and entertainment, that's a project that would be fascinating to me anyway. Yeah, it would probably be pretty interesting. I, uh, you know, I know there've been news, you know, magazine type packages yeah. done over the years, but I don't know that there's ever been kind of the modern day attempt to, uh, do the documentary approach to it. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, they're the number of people that have come out of it and have a, achieved, you know, great stuff is is very large. You mentioned, Paul, uh, before we go into <clears throat> your first couple of years of Letterman, um, I, I brought up the shopping cart story because of exactly, exactly <laughs> why, uh, what it was. You were, you know, the kid in a room and you got to be a kid for a mm -hmm. while at Letterman. And that's that, that yeah. I, I adore that you got that experience. Um, and we all know that the ups and downs of life are there. You were a head writer at Letterman. There were downs. I, I get it. Like the pressure of the <laughs> job alone, never mind the quirkiness of the production itself, the uniqueness of what yeah. you guys were doing, the vacuum that you guys were in. I get all of that. Um, so, so I, I, I can't wait to get to your first couple years of writing at Letterman where you got to be that kid for a while. Uh, that, that's mm -hmm. great. But I can't leave the lampoon without asking about some of the names that you, other names other than Paul that you were there with that resonate today, whether or not they're famous or not. Yeah, sure. I mean, like was Conan there when you were there? No, Conan was uh, gone by the time I he, got there, okay. but his, uh, you know, his, his name was a name you heard a lot. Um, I bet. 
yeah, he was a legend. And I remember him coming in once or twice while I was there. And it was, and, you know, he, he wasn't famous yet at that point, but it, he was famous there. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was, he was a celebrity there. Um, so, no, I did not overlap with him. I did overlap with Bill Oakley, yep. who, uh, you know, people will know that name. He uh, went on to run uh, with his partner, Josh Weinstein, some of the best years of The Simpsons, you know, among other amazing things he's done. Um, David X. Cohen, who uh, wow. created wow. Futurama yeah. Yeah, with Matt Groening, was there. These guys were both seniors when I was a freshman. Um, Jeff Schaefer, uh, you know, from Seinfeld and Curb and the league and the million other things he's done. Um, Alec Berg from Barry, uh, I'm going to forget people and I don't mean no, any not offense, at all, uh, no, but no. you know, We're but yeah, like my class and the classes ahead of me had phenomenal people. Um, Brian Rich, uh, uh, who, I was, I became very good friends with, um, went on to become uh, a legendary Conan writer. Um, he actually, he worked at Letterman, uh, early, <clears throat> excuse me, early in my run at Letterman. Um, he got hired there too. And so I got to work at Letterman with him for a brief period of time. It turned out he was much better suited for Conan and they yep. snapped him up. Yep. Um, and uh, people should, People should Google Google Brian Rich uh, if they don't know the story of how he, when he decided to leave Conan um, to go, uh, I think, work on Just Shoot Me or, you know, to pursue sitcom writing in L.A., he, as a prank, decided to uh, compete for the slot that he had opened up on the writing staff under a fake name. He decided to see if he could get his old job. <laughs> and I'll leave it there, but talk about commitment to the bit and uh, following through on a funny idea. It's one of the funniest things you'll see. Um, so uh, I think on the Conan podcast, I think they did essentially an episode about it. Um, but uh, Brian, unfortunately, very sadly, uh, passed away last year. Um, so you won't be able to ask him about that. Yeah. But uh, uh but We're yeah, keeping him he, alive right now, my friend. We're keeping him alive yeah. right now by by sharing this uh, a very, very, very amusing story. By the way, Don just sent me this. I'll put the picture up for everybody to see it. But that's at uh, Paul's going away party there. Uh, oh wow! In '92, and uh, um, oh cool. So uh, yeah. Um, so that's obviously uh, Paul and Joe at the farewell party back in '92 there. Um, He's also given me Adam Resnick. So, so over top of uh, what we're talking here, I'm going to throw these pictures yeah. on for the viewers to see. And Adam's book is on there as well. Don's been uh, throwing oh, stuff great. at me here this whole time. Um, I, yeah, I, I'd love I, for that, more people to find that book. Yeah. Well, you know what? And um, we'll do an entire episode on it. If we can, if we can make that, if we can make that happen, that's something that we like. One thing I want to do is I want to, uh, I was just going back and forth with, with, with Steve Young last night, partially uh, mm -hmm. to prepare for this. But also because we're just kind of friends now, and and uh, yeah, uh, you know, with some of the music that he has coming out, he's got this just trajectory where he's gone down this path where the beast must be fed, and it's these songs that just keep <laughs> coming out of him. I can't wait to help promote that stuff, and that's what I want. Oh yeah, you know, part of this show isn't just uh, you know, it's all of course the celebration of the greatest body of broadcast work in history, that of David Letterman and company, the company, and what they're doing now is mm -hmm. something that I very, very much want to be a part of, a, for lack of a better term, a promotion vehicle for. I want, I want to be able to, to throw this stuff out there because the sensibility has a through line and so many of us resonate with so many different, different things. Everybody who loved Letterman is going to love Adam's book. I know that already, even though I have not read it yet. Um, yeah, and, for sure. And, and, and so, you know, I want to talk to you about projects that you're doing as well and that kind of thing, but let's get to this place yeah. where, okay, you get on, um, a 13 week cycle. Is that, is that, are you, you hired yeah. on as a writer? You're not, you didn't come in as an intern. You came in as a writer. That's correct. I, yeah. yes, I sent in a package, a packet, whatever, uh, you know, a writing sample. Um, 
which I can probably dig up somewhere. Yes. It's, oh, I... it, you know, and <laughs> my, I'm, sh you know, it must have had something going for it. Um, Top ten list, of course. Yeah, um, my big memory is that uh, that. So, you know, Steve was the head writer, Steve O'Donnell, who hired me. And I remember after I got the job, being in his office for some reason and seeing my packet just like on a stack of paper or something, you know, and there was a note, like a sticky note on it that said, um, indications of a lively visual mind. <laughs> um, and I, uh, yeah, I'll never forget that phrase because it was like, there is one of my heroes um, writing something positive about my work. <laughs> and in uh, only the way that Steve O'Donnell communicates, that is a perfect yeah. Steve O'Donnell phrase right there. I know, right? It's, uh, <laughs> yes. I mean, he's, um, you know, verbally so, uh, you know, incredibly gifted and uh, has such a way of expressing himself. And and there it is. And uh, um, yeah, so I, you know, I, I think it was just one of those things where I was in the right place at the right time and yep. had made a connection through Paul and a slot opened up and, and there I was. Um, I, you know, I pretty much got the call to come in for an interview, which typically I think was just, they had already kind of decided to hire you, but they just wanted to get a look at you and make sure that you weren't, uh, really annoying or obnoxious or there's an energetic or, chemistry that yeah. needs to be confirmed. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I met Steve that day, he offered me the job, um, and then walked me out to, uh, the kind of vestibule by the elevator. And I was, um, <laughs> I was wearing what I thought was like a nice dress up outfit, which I think was sort of a very, wrinkly kind of linen or oxford like button blue button down shirt and dave happened to pop out of the elevator oh god and steve introduced me to him this is my first time <laughs> laying eyes on him and steve introduced me to him and his only words were uh you know have had that shirt pressed <laughs> and uh and then he just kept moving and i was like oh my god like this is crazy that this is happening to me. And uh, yeah. And then there I was and I started showing up every day at 30 rock because this was still at late night, not late yep. show. Um, yep. uh, and um, uh, it was, you know, it was thrilling, but it was, it was very intimidating and scary for me. Um, uh, especially because a lot of work is done in the room um, or was at the time. Uh, and I simply didn't have the, the confidence to open my mouth. You know, yeah. I was, um, and that's never been my, you know, my something I, I love. Like I don't, I don't love being in a big room full of people and, having to be funny, I find it very difficult to kind of get into the headspace that you need to be in to yeah. like generate a lot of ideas. I think it, I grew in that ability as time went on, but to be the new guy, to have people who are very comfortable <laughs> sitting around that table. Um, and you're 21 you know, at this point, right? I, I think I was closer to, um, 23 maybe okay so um, early 20s you're, you're yeah yeah you're 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 yeah. still you're not an, a fully formed adult by any stretch of the imagination not, working with fully no, formed no adults way. yeah and you know and at that point somebody who was 26 seemed old exactly and somebody who was 30 uh mid 30s as i think steve o'donnell would have been seemed like and you know a complete grown-up like yeah. um you know, and a distinguished and so, one at that. Very, yes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so I remember just being scared of everybody. I, certain people went out of their way to be friendly to me. One of them was Bill Sheft, mm -hmm. uh, who I'll always be grateful to for just 
being friendly, you know, um, one of them was Jill Davis, uh, who, you know, there were, I think there was a little bit of, um, yeah, I don't know. It's that thing of people who are sizing each other up, or, you know, or, you know what I mean? There, there was definitely that aspect to it. Um, yep. You got to earn some respect. You got to get some chops and earn some respect. And then, and then your friends, uh, you know, pushing each other around in shopping carts, but it, yeah. you gotta, you Zoe gotta get Friedman, that. Zoe Friedman, oh. I should add is I always, I always, I, you know, our kids ended up going to the same school in LA. And so I would see her frequently and I always happy to see her. Cause, uh, uh, <laughs> a funny thing that happened at the end of my first week at the show. Yeah. Um, we, I don't know what this was for, um, but we were invited to Gracie Mansion, the the mayor's residence in New York City. And so literally at the end of my first week, I was, you know, ushered into the back of a limousine to go to an event at Gracie Mansion. Is Co Koch is the mayor at that <laughs> point? It was Dinkins. Oh, it was Dinkins uh, at that point? Okay, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, and and I remember I didn't know anybody, you know, and, and I remember Zoe was in the back of the limo with me and, and some other people. And, yeah, she was just really nice. <laughs> so I've always been uh, thought warmly of her for that. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, it was very, very, very intimidating. And I I think I was I had certain um, misunderstandings of what I'd been hired to do. Mm -hmm. uh, one such misunderstanding was that from watching the show and from loving when things didn't work on the show. Absolutely. Loving it. Absolutely. Probably loving it the best of any aspect of the show. Yes. I had formulated <laughs> the notion that you were supposed to create stuff that would probably not play in front of a studio audience um, that was random or weird or rarefied. And so that's that was the target I was shooting at. I was- that's so interesting. I was writing like non, I was writing anti-humor in a sense, you know, not even like meta humor or how yeah. you would define that, but like anti-humor. I was writing things that, and a little of it came, I think from my Lampoon background where I think I think that was encouraged. That was part of it was yeah. uh, just, you know, a weird turn of phrase that didn't, uh, wasn't a joke per se, you yeah. know? And so yeah, I was just writing these things that didn't work. And I think the, you know, I don't think I was a shoe in to be picked up for another um, cycle. And a couple of weeks into my, uh, my after I was hired, um, Rob Burnett replaced Steve as head writer, and I believe at some point he kind of talked to me. He was like, you know, like this was good, this was good, but you know, like I'm sort of hoping you'll kind of turn the corner and start generating more stuff that like we can use, and that you know, Dave. Dave goes up in front of this audience of regular humans every night and he wants this stuff to play and kill. And I was kind of like, Oh, okay. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds crazy, but I swear to you, that was a moment for me. And I'm not going to say that from there on, everything I wrote was, was gold, but like, I started attacking it a different way and, you yeah. know, imagining is an audience going to laugh at this? Yeah. And I think became more productive, um, you know, and more relaxed in the room. And I found certain things that I was suited for. Um, like I, I think the top 10 is probably, was probably my favorite part of the show to actually work on, which might be, you know, be surprising, but like, I loved it. And I think it was something that I, I got to feel like I was good at. Um, and I, I remember maybe the first joke, not that I got on, cause I'm sure I got on kind of a more 
hacky kind of thing, but I, I remember, um, I maybe Don could track down because I can never remember what the topic was. Um, and I haven't been able to find it by Googling, but I, I believe, uh, it was about president, uh, George H.W. Bush and the, maybe it wasn't, but it, my joke was something to the effect of him popping up and down and, and saying more explosions, more explosions as in explosions like with an, apo the, with an apostrophe, like, yeah, explosions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And maybe it was a 4th of July. Like, I don't even know what it was. All I can tell you is that, that words in it though, that, Yeah, explosions. I More feel like explosions. Don might have some sort of a data uh, a spreadsheet or something. But anyway, okay, okay we'll, so we'll find out. Anyway, yeah. It, and my point is not this is some great joke, and I obviously can't even remember what it was. But at that turn of phrase, I think I had hit the bullseye for yeah. the first time, where it was like, uh, Dave chuckled at this. And I remember yeah. I remember his assistant, Lori Diamond, like in the hallway right outside the, the uh studio like laughing at it and being like oh that was great that was great and like yeah and th then it was like okay i think i'm in I i'm part of it way in. there it is yeah yeah and and <laughs> you know i started becoming more useful to the show uh and well you just saying um, that word now yeah. like like seriously john you just saying that word right now um kind of ignited the letterman receptors like that is i, mm -hmm. I think about it and, and, and it's, it's maybe it's in one of the books there or not but but it's it's um that word there you can see it on the screen you can hear dave with his cadence uh yeah. saying it and and you could just it just that is a perfect yes there it is right there um uh, let's yeah. go back is that that's not the first thing you got on do you remember the first thing you got on i really wish i did i think okay. it was yeah. um it was it, it uh, I'm 99% sure it was a boring top 10, like yeah. the kind of top 10 that, you know, it's number eight and yep. it's serviceable. <laughs> most <laughs> common answer remember. from a writer, by the way, to that question is exactly that. Uh, yeah. the most, that's the, by far the most common answer. Um, um, the other thing too is, is, uh, one of the things that I appreciate about you, uh, and by the way, now, uh, man, I, I will say it in the intro when I shoot the intro, obviously, but, uh, I've got to reiterate um you know through 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 the the magic of, of video production and time travel i suppose i'm going to reiterate the the staff favorite moments you did uh with walter was incredible because i love the way oh, that you thanks. took it I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a relationship connection guy um and so the fact that you came from it from a um i'm going to talk about the relationships that i i had built the friendships yeah. and then and then it went from there it was so touching i love what you say oh. about rob um, uh, and, and, and cause I mean, you're not just a friend and a partner and all that, but a mentor. And it sounds oh, yeah. to me like you just, uh, gave us the genesis of the mentorship. He takes over as head mm -hmm. writer and, 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 and like, um, Steve saw in you, uh, he saw something, uh, had mm -hmm. been around longer, knew what you just said, new explosions already. He knew that already, <laughs> um, you know, had that, had that, uh, culture down. Um, but and then kind of gave you that little, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you move a cruise ship, you're, you're not, you're not moving the whole dial. You're just giving it a little adjustment. And he gave you that little adjustment. That mentorship began that day. It sounds like. Um, I think that's safe to say and accurate. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I mean, he was a guy I was, you know, kind of scared of, uh, in my early days there, uh, you know, sitting around that table, but once I think once I had once I had demonstrated that I wasn't you know going to be somebody it wasn't worth getting know getting to know because I was going to be gone in a few weeks um <laughs> it, the, the room kind of warmed up to me and um yeah and he was he was about seven years six or seven years older than me so I I definitely saw him as a a grown-up and you know, and he'd gotten the head writer job for God's sake. Um, but he, he invested heavily in me, in Donick and in other, you know, younger writers to, um, to help us figure it out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was often part of like, kind of a little core group that, 
that he'd gather to try to really crack something, or solve a problem, you know. Uh, and I learned a ton. I, I mean, I could probably write a short book just on how much I learned from him, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he, yeah, he was, I hate this phrase, but he was able to kind of see the matrix in a way that, you know, yeah. that I, I, I love that phrase at yeah, all it, at that point. Yep. Um, and help me understand just how comedy worked a little bit because I, you know, I, I thought of myself as funny in, in certain ways, but I had no craft and I had, I just, I didn't know how to do like a setup and a punchline and how to frame something. Um, you know, like he, he did a piece much later that I think was just watching water boil. Um, and it, it was like today, you know, on the show, we're going to watch water boil. And it was literally that. And they, they turned on a, you know, a flame under, under a, a clear, you know, pot of water. But the point of it was how it was framed as if it was a spectacle yes. with a, a buildup yes. and an escalation and a payoff. Yep. And like that, you know, I doubt that's the piece he's proudest of, but it was like kind of this pure thing of like, here is how comedy and entertainment works is yeah. it's framing, you know? And like, there's aspects of that, that, uh, you know, 30 years later in running a writer's room on a, on a sitcom I am using, mm -hmm. um, you know, so yeah, he. I I tried to talk a little bit about it with Walter and Gaines on the Letterman favorite moments, but that that Steve Martin David, you know, the oh. the making of Steve's appearance yeah. that I think appeared on some uh, anniversary shows and the like. Yeah. Um, that was just such a great example, and I I you know Rob is also a great joke writer and just a funny guy. I'm not diminishing that in any way, but he had a real genius for how to put something together and how to realize what it really wanted to be. And yeah, that was the thing where Daniel Kellison, mm -hmm. uh, who I know you've spoken to, um, Absolutely. who, uh, you know, is a good friend. He, um, he was, uh, he was, uh, in the talent department <clears throat> segment producer and Steve was his guest. And, um, and he or he and Steve or just Steve, I don't know who had an idea of shooting some uh, clips of like, uh, you know, the re the rehearsal for his appearance, which was a funny idea. It was like, you know, Steve didn't know how to pick up the cup of water, really, yeah. like pick up the mug and he kept missing. And, you know, it was all like. Or what laugh should little... I use for a joke? Like, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so we had shot these bits and, and I remember bringing them to Rob or maybe Rob and Dave and it being like, but what, how do you roll into, like, what do we do with these? Like, cause they didn't have like beginnings, middles and ends and whatever. And it was Rob's idea to be like, Oh, you know what we should do is we should shoot uh, Dave and Steve talking to camera, like, they're in a documentary and we can voice over and assemble these things into a piece. And, you know, I don't, I guess there's a reason that example keeps occurring to me just because like, I felt like my brain broke open kind of in, <laughs> in things like that, where, you know, where it was like, it was, it, again, another cliche, and I feel like Mal Malcolm Gladwell or something, but like, you know, out of the box thinking yeah. where instead of just trying to solve the puzzle you're working on, you take a step back from it and, you know, reconceive a whole other thing around it yeah. um, was something that he was, Rob was extraordinarily good at. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, there was, he was a hugely important mentor to me. Um, and, you know, during that time, uh, I just, I mean, I talked about it on 
on uh, the Letterman channel, but I had colleagues that, that I learned a lot from as well. And just, you know, became extremely close with, even if uh, only temporarily so in some cases, but in others, I think for life. You know, you, you mentioned Malcolm Gladwell uh, also uh, might even be in the same, in the same publication talking about the 10,000 hours. And, 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 and to me, yeah. you know, you, that's, that's, you've just described two examples of your, of you putting in your 10,000 hours. Um, and, mm -hmm. and both of them had very similar connotations teaching you actually how to it's again, you know, and again, that's the Leno Letterman comparison, right? You know, the, the, the Leno is a, a joke maker and a joke teller. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. um, but this program, and one of the reasons why I think it resonates and has, you know, the status that it does with all of us uh, or with all of our personality types who love it so much is, is, is the water boiling example where you're actually using the device of what late night is. You are taking advantage right. of, okay, we're watching water boil, but there's some X factors that we're throwing in. We're setting the volleyball for Hal Gurney. Uh, who's bumping it back to somebody else and who's setting it again for Letterman now to react to this stuff. So there's the, right. you know, the, you know, Gurney with, with, with his expert direction, you know, the, the, the technical crew who were all kind of in on things as well, how it's going to be shot. Um, and then of course, relying on, um, you know, perhaps the, you know, the great, I call him the greatest broadcaster ever because he also had the razor sharp wit as well as the ability to communicate at the same time. And then, this this writing that sets that volleyball you're all just doing stuff together and it's a perfectly well-oiled machine by that point you know it seems like rob had that down which again the sensibility of the show that's why the head writer becomes the head writer <laughs> um yeah the sensibility of the show is so important i mean i can't mm -hmm. tell you how many writers uh, or people i've talked to behind the scenes who maybe you know didn't get renewed haven't come on the show yet whatever um because they were funny, hilarious, but the sensibility oh, yeah. of the show was such an important element. Um, you saw Rob right when he became head writer, you mm -hmm. head writer yourself. Um, did you notice a change in him? Cause you saw him go from writer to head writer. Um, did the stress of that particular job and Rob obviously extremely successful, uh, if only by looking at the numbers, how long he did it for, how he moved into the, uh, executive positions at Worldwide Pants and all that, very successful of integrating himself into that world. Mm -hmm. Did you notice him leveling up as you were getting your 10,000 hours and leveling up, learning these things? Did you notice him changing as well at that time? I don't know if I could have perceived it as him changing because I, you know, he seemed fully formed to me when I met him and started working under him. Yep. Um, but... I think, you know, if there was a leveling up, it happened during the period of time when uh, when Dave had signed on to do the CBS Late Show, yep. but we hadn't yet started to do it. So we had this period of time of months where all there was to do was put stuff in the bank for... Um, for Late Show. And yep. it was why the Late Show started so strong. It was because we had oh, yeah. all these remotes and all these ideas. And, yep. um, and I think, you know, Rob was, uh, I think, a crucial kind of partner to Dave in making that transition as successful as it was. And yep. I, I like to think that I was kind of a crucial partner to Rob in getting all that stuff done because I, you know, and not to take away from the other writers who were as well, but like, no, but yeah, I, I, um, good for you for being able to own that, by the way, I, I that's, that, that <laughs> might be, the, that might be the least self deprecating thing that any writer, <laughs> it's the closest thing to, to, to recognizing your own <laughs> massive achievement, which we all recognize, oh. but boy, oh boy, is it hard to get you guys to, to, but, but that was that's funny. It was the biggest part of entertainment ever at that point. Time Magazine, everybody talking about Letterman moving yeah. over. And you guys hit an absolute grand slam home run with I the first 18 did. months uh, of that show. And and, and it was absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for the fact that that is what it was in entertainment and you're able to say, well, you know what? And I'm actually 
kind of proud about my contribution to it. Yes, I it mean, was massive, John. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? Maybe part of it is that, uh, and I know this is true of other writers in, uh, of my period at the show, but like when Zinnemann's book came out, of course, yeah. everyone got a hold of it and was like, you know, all right, well, you know, <laughs> am I in the book? Like what, what's going on here? And, <laughs> you know, if you were mostly uh, or entirely a CBS person, yep. you found that this job that you had had for maybe two years, maybe five years, maybe 15 years, mm -hmm. maybe 20 years was essentially not part of the story of the show. Yeah. And I, I, I am in the book. Um, but like, I kind of, yeah, it was like, wow, I'm sort of a footnote to my own entire career. <laughs> and so uh -huh. I do, I do feel the urge to stick up for, and you know, I, I have no grudge against him. No. And he, well, hold on a second though. Like he had like, a monumental story to tell and chose to tell, yeah, like focusing on, you know, what is arguably the most important part of it, and that's fine. I don't care. Uh, I'm not like mad about it. Hold on, hold but... on though. I got, I got to speak to this because <laughs> no, no, there, there is a there. Uh, he had a really like almost Sophie's Choice kind of uh, a choice right. that he had to make. He talked about it on this show uh, because he did not want to make the. Uh, he had to make the choice. Like he has enough material for another book. Mm -hmm. And 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 did not want to make the choice of putting out an 800 pound uh, right. or 800 page, I should say, book about right. about it. And so he had to keep it. And it's a big book anyway. But yeah, he actually had to make the choice to not. Um, and I have asked him a couple of times because he's like, I've had all this material about late. I'm like, please, <laughs> if you got any dailies, I would love to <laughs> I would love to screen the dailies of that book. So, 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 uh, and it was a hard choice for him because yeah. the stories are so rich and, and, and Lecha was the majority of the career and it was, you know, our, you, you and my, our generation's tonight show, right. but it was the preparation that allowed that to happen. But what mm -hmm. happened was incredible. Like, again, I mean, I love, I love, uh, uh, I love late show so, so, so much. And and everyone yeah. has this everyone has this reverence for late night. I have it too. Don't get me wrong, but boy oh boy, do I love uh, late show and what you guys did there. So so there is that material there. You have now given me a wonderful wonderful clip. Oh, Don's just coming back on. Hey buddy, um, you've given me a wonderful excuse to go back to Zinnemann and poke him a little bit to see if if those pages <laughs> uh, could ever be. Anyway, I'm sorry about that aside, John, but but that is a very important distinction in that book. There's so much richness in how Late Show was made. Hi, Don, you're yeah. back. Uh, hi, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm butting in, but there's no way other... Uh, uh, my my laptop conked out and it took me the next 30 minutes to, to reboot. So I've missed oh, the last no. 30 minutes of the conversation. No problem. Uh, and and I'm butting in now, so I don't know if it's a good time or if I should... It is. Here. Jump in. All right. Uh, and, and if you've already talked about this while I was gone, then too bad. Um, I wanted to ask you more about Ed um, and the and the writing process and the and the. It's it's a naive question from someone who's 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 never been in in that in 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 the work that you do or did or still do. Uh, the fact that you and Rob and sometimes others wrote every episode. Mm -hmm. how far in advance was the writing <laughs> process did, 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 I'm, did, did, I'm did. laughing because the answer ranged from months in advance to we were writing pages and they were running them down to the the studio I mean we got so behind on that show that we were like sued by the directors <laughs> and <laughs> or fined. I don't oh, think the no. word sued. I think fined <laughs> is more accurate. Um, maybe they also sued us. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, I remember an episode that we were conceiving at, literally as it was being shot, where we would have to 
be like, all right, well, we have, we sort of have this B story that we can feed them, but what's the A story going to be? I mean, it was insanity. Um, uh, You know, I always think of those shows more, this does not apply to late night comedy writing, which is more day by day, but like, uh, you know, prime time, 22 episode seasons of TV is like, you're being chased by a monster who's faster than you. So like, give it enough time, the monster will catch you. You know what I mean? And, and you're kind of, you're throwing pages behind you as you run for the monster to gobble, but like, you can't outrun the monster, you know? So like, it, that's why I say it's the hardest thing that I've done. Um, You know, I just, finished doing uh, the first season of a show for Amazon that we can talk about later, but like that was so much easier because it, it, it was not being shot while it was being written. So I never felt like I was being chased by the monster, but Mm -hmm. on Ed, it was, um, you know, it's people who can do that on a network season after season, like even if the show is, not what you'd think of as your sort of thing or is not, you know, the critics don't love it. Or even if nobody watches it, they've achieved something remarkable in my opinion, yes. because it's, uh, it's crazy what a job that is. Um, I guess what, what I was, did you have, uh, uh, you're talking about the the immediacy of, of, of fixing or, or figuring out a part of an A story or a B story. Um, did you have the general plot outlined before the season began, or were you were you did you come across cul-de-sacs and and you mm-hmm. figured the only way out is to is to, is to do a Dallas? You know, I mean, how it, it's both, it's both, and anybody <laughs> who works in that form who claims otherwise is not being honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. you you try to chart your path as much as you can. And we would do that. We'd be like, all right, I think, and we'll look at this six six episode chunk as where a certain arc happens between this and that character. We know where it's going to start. We know where it's going to end. And you'd often be able to stick to that, but sometimes you'd run out of material too quickly and you'd be like, we can't stretch it that long or other times, you know, like uh, a guest, I don't know that this happened to us particularly, but like a guest person you cast as a guest, you'll not love, you know, or like you'll Mm -hmm. find that you're just not getting great feedback. And so it's. And you had them committed for several episodes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 Um, or uh, to the contrary, the viewers love this person. And now something that you thought you were going to be done with, you bring back, you know, there, there's Mm -hmm. all, there's all kinds of ways that, um, that you can be thrown off track. Um, uh, so you have to be able to think on the fly and, change your mind about stuff, you know? Um, I think it's to the detriment of shows when they make a plan and then they don't acknowledge the reality on the ground, you know, of what actually happened while they were making their their series, you know? Uh, so yeah, it's, that's, man, that's a tough job. Um, can I ask you, you, know, quick, the, can I ask you a quick that, question about yeah. that with Ed, pretending to Ed? So, uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, you know, Kelly Ripa shows up and has a beautiful <laughs> chemistry with Tom Cavanaugh and right. she wasn't Kelly Ripa, Kelly Ripa back then. It was just. It, she it, sort of was though, She, right? she was, like, well, I, I'm just saying compared to who people know who she is now uh, right. at, at that point, it was very formative still at that point, uh, you know, um, compared, yeah. to, compared to now. Um, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's an obvious chemistry. There's an obvious, uh, you know, charisma there. Do you guys then go, okay, you know what? We've got something cool here. We're going to, you know, that's now now a device that we have and it's going to alter 
things that we might have written months and months and months ago, and that will create uh you know chain reactions throughout Poss possibly i wish i wish i could remember more specifically but like i'm just using that as an example yeah, though i mean yeah. but yeah yes and like yeah and you've got you know the network calling and saying oh you know the the president of the network is loving this character and so then you're like well we kind of like our show to stay on the air which was never <laughs> a guarantee and so yeah it's like you're living in a a changing developing situation and you have to embrace and try to amplify the things that you did well and kind of move past the things that you know you didn't um yeah i, I was i was scanning through the shows last night looking for uh one particular image that that i couldn't find uh, and while i was looking for it i i, I may have passed by it uh, I was looking for cameos with you and Rob, and 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 the first one was yeah. was the obvious one. Um, yeah, the, the final. Yeah, show. that was in the finale. That's yeah. right. But there's another one that I remember. It was just photos on on the wall, and and the two yeah. of you, you you look drunk and stoned and just out of it, and and <laughs> that's what I was looking for, and I couldn't find. Uh, that feels like it was previous winners of the pie eating contest maybe <laughs> i feel like i feel like it, like the two pie club i feel it was okay. like people who had consumed two entire <laughs> pies at like one sitting and so i think our expressions were intentionally like the way you'd look after eating two <laughs> pies um, I what i can't remember this is the crazy part did that even air because it, it, it did because I remember it, watching it and and noticing it at the time. Uh, so look look at the first episode. I would say. Now I look at the well, the very first one one. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. the reason I say that is because I think we we actually piloted that show twice. Once for CBS was, and then again oh, for NBC. Right. As a half hour and an hour, right? Like when it was called Welcome both to hours. Or oh, both like hours. Okay. Yeah. It was at one point it was called Stuckyville. And oh, yeah. then yeah, and we um we did a pilot for CBS that they passed on and it that I believe had the pie bit in it, mm -hmm. and that I think we may have that's why I think it would be in the the first episode, because we would have like done it again in the NBC version or something. Some of this is I just can't remember because it was so long ago. But like, I would I would start your search by watching that episode carefully. Yeah, I'm doing um, it as we speak. Okay. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm watching the the uh, the DVD uh, collection that you, that you released. <laughs> I wish I we wish. all do. Um, I cannot wait till Ed comes out because it is it's a time capsule too. Uh, uh, but yeah. I I feel like. Um, it will age very well and it will be very charming. Um, my wife is actually going through, it's funny. I was, I was messaging back with Rigalski back and forth a little bit because my wife, she's building a, a tech company right now and it's a very stressful thing. And so during her downtime, she will have just comfort food TV on in the background and she's going through Gilmore girls right now. And, and yep. it's funny when I'll walk in the room and there'll be a certain thing. Uh, it'll be really funny to hear, you know, Dave Rigalski's name because he's the character in the show sort of, um, they wrote him into it. And, 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 uh, but, it's 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 comfort food and it's charming and it's a time capsule and i'm certain ed will be in even for me anyway an even better example of that um when we all get a chance to watch it again you know let the streaming gods figure out a way Don't for that hold to your happen. breath, <laughs> yeah. hold your breath. Not, not in not in the first episode uh but, it, but oh, if it's weird if it's, a, if it's a pie eating contest that that's a good clue i'll, I'll, I'll look for it there also while, while i was looking for it uh, I came across this and, and got a big kick out of the uh, the picture. Dave Grohl. There's the food well, fighters. The food, yeah, 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 yeah. I, thought, I, I, I like that as as yet one one more inside joke. Yeah, yeah. Which that was, was which, yeah. That that's, that's it's an obvious question we... I wanted to ask about that. Did that happen yeah. right away? Getting next year as your as your theme song, or as your opening? Uh... It happened because we. I hope I'm getting this right. So 
you know, back at the time we were making that show, uh, if you're, you know, you're making your pilot and you're putting in needle drops, you know, meaning, uh, uh, you know, cues of actual, uh, you know, famous or less famous music that, mm -hmm. that is out there in the world in the hopes that it will make your show cooler. Mm -hmm. um, and my recollection is that, you know, you I, like, I remember bringing in a, a book of CDs that I just happened to own and, or it could have been one of Rob's CDs and we had the Foo Fighters and that song worked over the opening montage of the show. Yeah. And it had the right vibe and we used it. And then we had to get permission, you know, and I imagine that, you know, it was very helpful that we were part of the Letterman show, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which as you know, um, Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters had a real affinity with. And right there, yeah. oh yeah, nice That's from the last night. Yeah. And so we got to use it, but then something awful happened, which was uh we couldn't use it anymore. <laughs> so the the subsequent seasons of the show, I think we only got maybe it was a budgetary thing, like we we only got the money because it was expensive, you yeah. know, it was super expensive. Um, and yeah, when we got picked up again, it was like, you can't have the show. Like the studio told us, like, I, I guess you can't, I mean, you can't have the song. And, um, mm -hmm. and so we had to replace it. Um, but, uh, and then am I crazy to think that we brought it back? <laughs> For later? some reason, I think, I, you, I think I, you did. I think, I think I, we, no, I, I have a memory yeah. of it of it being yeah. there yeah no 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 is that, i remember is some nice. executive we were very upset to have to lose it and i remember some executive kept saying to us on the phone like i know i know it's your lucky glove it's your lucky glove meaning like they thought it was just like a totem that we believed you know it was like brought us good luck and we're like no, it's the theme oh, song for and it is. show. People and it fits love perfectly. it. <laughs> yep, it does. It's so perfect for a small town show. Like it was perfect. It's a nostalgic sounding song. It is a yeah. perfect song for that. Absolutely. I did. I did also very much like I the. Uh, I can't hear anything. I can't okay. hear anything. Okay. Oh yeah. They don't want to get us pulled off YouTube. Thank you for that, Don. The. The song by a band called Clem Snide that we put in afterwards was also great, but it's just, it's hard competing with something people already really like, you know? That, uh, um, you know, and I, I can't wait to get into Ed here. It's cool, Don, when you came back, it, we're right around the time now where, uh, you know, because I, where I wanted to take this episode to was to Ed, but to John working in with Worldwide Pants rather than, uh, you know, more so rather than just the day-to-day -day of the show, but we're at the place mm -hmm. right now where um, I got to ask you about fun with Phil. We got to go to fun with Phil for a second here. Cause we're sure. at that time, in my opinion, that is probably the most legendary late show early on bit that, you know, and, and of course our, our, our affinity and our love for Rupert Rupert, by the way, yeah. uh, told me to tell you hello again. He loves you so oh, much okay. and he's so grateful. Um, uh, you know, so we'll get, we'll get to that in a second, but Don, uh, you were off, uh, you didn't hear any of this stuff. So we I got an assignment for you. I thought you were in the background looking for it. There's a top 10 list back in the day, uh, that, that, uh, that John, um, you know, this is one of the, one of the, uh, the seminal moments had the word explosions in it. He can't remember yes. what it has to do with it George W. Bush, but the word explosions, like with an apostrophe and that I word think there. Yeah, I think the joke included the phrase in quotes, more explosions, more explosions. And it, yeah, it was just significant because I think it was the first time I remember getting something on the list that, you oh, know, so people really seem to like. Yeah, yeah. late night. Okay, yeah, exactly. So I thought uh, there there might be the uh, the ability to see the bat computer in motion right now yeah. and how quickly it, you can it, do that. Um, in, in the meantime, let, let me just, I, uh, I just yeah. want to follow up. Uh, yeah. Season one had the Foo Fighters. Season two was the alternate one. And then season mm -hmm. three and season four, you were back to Foo Fighters. Okay, there it is. Oh. Yeah, there it is. Um, cool. Okay. This is important. This is for the, 
the legacy. The DVD yeah. set that doesn't exist. Yeah, well, Don's got them all anyway. So <laughs> it's, uh, um, uh, and I'm envious of, of 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 the stuff that he has there. Um, so you're at, you're 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 now moved to the Ed Sullivan Theater. You're banking stuff. Mm -hmm. um, those, mm -hmm. my, I have kind of three favorite moment, three uh, time periods of Letterman that I love. Uh, the Dead Man Walk in Time at, at at late night that last year was mm -hmm. absolutely awesome. Um, mm -hmm. The first year, of course, of, of of Late Show, and then and then when Late Shift Two happened in 2010 uh, with Dave, just absolutely not to use uh, not mistakenly to use the term lampooning uh, Jay and in the whole situation that right. was happening. I just that period was incredible as well right. uh let's go back to you're a big part of and we haven't even got um, yeah we have to have you back because we haven't even gotten to the first extra that uh that, that you were a part of and never mind the legendary one with bill murray and 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 all of these performing things actually i need to ask mm -hmm. that how long into your run was your first on camera um experience I think it was fairly early and I feel like it was probably uh, a staff stories piece. I don't know if this was the very first time I appeared on camera, but I was in a staff stories piece uh, at NBC where we went to uh, an Italian restaurant. We sat around the table and everyone told a story. I got, <clears throat> I got picked to do this. Um, my story was such a non-story. I don't know why I got picked, but it, I mean, I guess it was kind of funny. It was about a time in college where I went to Pizzeria Uno and I ordered a medium pizza. I was with a friend, ordered a medium pizza and they brought us a large, but we didn't know that. We just ate it. And then they brought the bill and it was for a large. And I decided to stick to my guns and be like, I ordered a medium so, and they were like but you ate a large and i was like but i didn't ask for that so it's not fair like i don't have yeah. any money you can't make me pay <laughs> three extra dollars i do not have it you know and i mean the thing that made it a story was they called the police so they got two cambridge cops to come in off the street and you know the guy's like you know so what's your story and i <laughs> told him and then they they looked at the people and were like too bad like you know like you can't charge them for that just let it go and so i won and i was so happy and then uh the 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 payoff of the story was as i very smugly got up to leave uh the the server shouted to my back as I was going out the door. Next time, know the difference between a medium and a large. It's like, what a random thing to yell at someone. Like, okay, I will take that under advisement. Um, was, was, you was, know, did, did this enact, was there a reenactment with the- uh, Yes, Tony, uh, Tony Randall. Randall. Yes. Uh, so, August 14th, 1992. There we go. Well, there you go. Because at that point I had only been at the show um, for you know june and july and part of august i think so you um, started after the carson announcement uh I, I suppose you're right yeah yeah and, and and i mean uh from what i've heard after the carson announcement there was a different energy around that place like like the vibration had had, had mm -hmm. changed got more intensified um but you were so yeah, nobody knew what was going to happen it was yeah. uh you know, and I certainly didn't know anything about what was going to happen. Um, but You're I was just hoping to get another 13 weeks. There. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I got that job, I think I've said this before, but, um, and this is not, in fact, true, but just to reflect how I thought of getting that job. Yep. I thought the show was by far the funniest thing on TV. Yeah. Um, even though there were other funny things, I thought it was the funniest thing. And I knew there were about a dozen writers. And so I thought that by getting that job, it meant that somehow I was one of the dozen top comedy writers in show business. <laughs> I, that's what I thought. Oh, because... that's such a beautiful childlike 
perspective. I know. Like that's, that's because yeah. I didn't understand the, the concept of kind of junior, you know, entry level writers and the fact that a lot of people who go into comedy writing their first job is on a late night talk show. And I didn't get any of that. I just thought based on quality and how funny it is, this is the funniest. And I got this job. This is crazy. <laughs> like that's, that's how I, I thought about it. Um, Did you know Joe I Grossman very well? I, no, I, okay. He was out of your I time. I sort of essentially. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, the reason I bring him up is, is, uh, you know, and you mentioned this actually in the staff favorite moments thing, but, but, um, uh, you know, back, back when I wanted you on the show originally, uh, I wanted to ask you about the Bill Murray segment, uh, watch, uh, please go watch, uh, John staff favorite moments, uh, because there's the segment with Bill Murray was fantastic. It's actually been shown a couple of times on the, uh, in different, uh, incarnations on, uh, from different points of view, uh, on the, what Letterman was the date channel. on that? The Bill Murray thing that that would have been that winter. That, that would have been ninety two, so, I think, as well. I know I watched that in high school for sure. I remember that segment very, very well. I believe it. It was the winter. You know, I got hired in the spring, and it would have been that winter. Um, it seems to me. Um, okay. Yeah, and this was a time when I really was still getting my feet wet at the show. You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, I. You know, I'd probably turn the corner, as Rob put it, and had, you know, some successes and had become part of things. But, um, but to be cast 12, in that bit, we have twelve ninety three. Was was the Al Sharpton Bill Murray thing? What month? Twelve. Oh, October. Uh, February February twelfth, nineteen ninety three. February. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. There you go. So yeah, okay. 90, that, that's, during the dead man. So well, yeah. There that's, like yeah. three quarters of a year or so. Yeah. Um, but I didn't come up with that piece just for the record. I no, 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 I no. can't remember for certain who did. It might've been Spike, um, but I was cast in it. And, yeah. um, and I found myself, yeah, doing comedy with Bill Murray and Al Sharpton for God's sake. Um, and skating with Bill Murray, holding hands. Uh, it was surreal. And I was, I was recognized on the subway the next day. Oh, um, that is, that's fantastic. I love hearing that yeah. PS to it. Uh, th that was that there's the question right there. So, so you're familiar with Joe Grossman, right? Like, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, okay. So he's really funny. Yeah. Oh, he's great. Ab absolutely. Um, but also did not come up with this bit was cast in in the bit uh because <laughs> right. of the because of the facial expression and whatnot and 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 i love yeah uh, talking to him I about think he okay got my my old parts there we go <laughs> okay so that was that was kind of where i'm going with that a little bit uh yeah. in, in segments like that where you were supposed to kind of have it the sullen kind of a thing the bill murray one right. being probably the best example of that uh, because that's that was the centerpiece of the of, of of the writing. Um, did you break a lot during that? Like, were there times where he was trying to break you? No. It was it. Yeah, okay. You guys just got her done. I I was terrified. I think so. I I wouldn't have been in a position to like be enjoying the comedy of Bill Murray okay. while I was on camera. I think I was just like, <laughs> oh, please don't let me screw this up because it was live. Yeah, you know, those yeah. were not pre taped Rollins. Those were. A, a light would turn we're, on. We're going through the halls. Suddenly, Here we go. And we're, yeah, like it was, it was live to tape, you know, TV. And so I, there was a whole audience watching me do that stuff. And no. Um, so yeah, it was live and we just did it. And uh, I was, you know, I was probably had, you know, just crazy amount of adrenaline and praying that I, I wasn't going to flub it, mess it up, make Bill Murray angry at me, <laughs> make Dave Letterman angry at me. Um, but I, even though I'm not a performer and I'm a shy guy, I did enjoy doing bits like that. It was, um, you know, for one thing, I think you got like, I don't know if it was like 700 bucks or something. Yeah. It was like a crazy amount of money to just get to, um, you know, people really wanted those, those little appearances because you could really supplement your, your income for the week from uh, getting Absolutely. cast in something. Well, Chris um, Shikai, when he came on, he talked about that. He, he broke it down because that's his mind, right? Breaking these things down for, he did that so long for, for the musical acts and whatnot. He very yeah. uh, succinctly put it, 
you wanted to be, um, is it a principal? Is that what it was? Uh, if you had a couple lines or whatever, you, you wanted got, to speak, it yeah. kept bumping it up. Yeah. It kept bumping right. it up as to, um, as to, as to what you could be. Now, that being said, uh, when it comes to remotes and extras and things like that, when you move over to late show, probably mm -hmm. the most legendary, legendary one is, is, um, our, 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 our fun with Rupert segment that we all love so much with our friend Rupert G. Uh, by the way, okay, yeah. before we get to that, uh, how did it feel the first time you realized you had a sandwich named after you? Was that a, that must've been a kind of a neat feeling. <laughs> that was, that was a lifetime highlight. I mean, there we go. <laughs> that's never going to happen again. That was, yeah, that was crazy. And then, yeah, the only um, thing I'll say is I think it left the menu at some point and I had to do <laughs> some soul searching, but, uh, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, that was, that was crazy. That was like, for to be able to walk somebody to be able to bring my parents to a, a you know a deli in new york city and be like look up there i mean oh my god that was the the greatest thing ever and i did happen to enjoy the beckerman although i i feel i enjoyed the Sh the schaefer a bit more that was more of my go-to that one that was seems a to be the most sandwich the that i was gonna say that one seems to be the one that that people seem to like the most um, i can still um, taste it today in my mind, I can taste the Schaefer. Oh, that is gonna right there. That's gonna that's gonna make Rupert feel so good right there. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Don? I'm having trouble finding this top ten list. Can you tell me again the, the oh, uh, too bad the, the um uh the I title. just don't remember very much about it. I don't remember the topic. The topic. Uh, yeah. I feel like it might have been something about George H. Uh, w. Bush, but I'm not positive. And I feel like it involved. Him jumping around saying more explosions, more explosions. Um, but that's all I can tell you. So um, it would likely have been during the uh, the election season of ninety two. Yeah, that sounds about yeah. right. I mean, could it, well, yeah, you weren't there for for Desert Storm, right? Uh, was no, I was, so but but yeah, like that during had the election, just that happened. Been, yeah, yeah, okay, so. Uh, we'll get it area. we'll find it <laughs> oh yeah no yeah now don's don gets on a mission and <laughs> it may be midnight tomorrow night uh where the text shows up but it'll be <laughs> um okay so rupert we set the stage with that uh you know obviously mm -hmm. the the affinity you guys have for each other um at rupert's retirement party there was a trivia contest uh i was standing <sighs> right beside rob burnett most likely to his absolute chagrin ah oh, crap i gotta stand beside the letterman podcast guy um, <laughs> one of the questions was um, fun with Rupert and Chris Shakai actually was the guy who was uh, emceeing that trivia contest. It was very, very fun. I saw it. Yeah, yeah it was. And, and uh, without missing a beat, you know, one of the questions uh, originally Rupert was not cast in, um, in, 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 in the fun with Rupert segment. It was somebody else who was it. And without missing a beat, Rob Burnett beside me, John Beckerman raises his hand, <laughs> wins the, wins the t-shirt. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was a great moment. Um, the concept, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like such a natural concept. Dave is 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 more famous than almost anybody in New York. He cannot, he can no longer be the man on the street, but yet has mm -hmm. the absolute, uh, uh, you know, is the perfect man on the street because of that razor sharp wit. Um, right. The concept of having a device where he can still do that without actually doing that, it seems so natural. Do you remember, but that at the same time, you're moving over from NBC to see was, was that concept conceived as part of the bank uh, in 30 no. rock knowing we're doing that? Or was it actually conceived it uh, at CBS? It came later. Okay. Yeah. To, to my recollection, it came later. Um, they, one of my first successful remotes was fun with a car phone. Oh, at, I love car phone, night. car phone night was, yeah. And, yep. And, and, and w McDonald's came before fun with Rupert, right? Um, the drive through, I, I believe yeah, the drive through, yeah. uh, because oh, I, now you got me thinking. I, the reason I'm asking is because there was sort of a precedent. I mean, obviously David called people on the phone, you know, and messed around with them. But yeah. there was kind of a precedent for pieces and even pieces that I worked on because I I was the 
one who pitched and edited uh, Fun with a Car Phone. And then mm -hmm. I, I edited McDonald's. That wasn't my idea, but I'm pretty sure. But I, for some reason, I edited that piece. Um, and so I think I had, you know, I'd thought a lot about, oh, it's great when Dave can mess with people and they don't know it's him. <laughs> and then I think the, the jump was, and I don't know how I, or why I thought of it was, yeah, what if he's feeding lines to somebody like a puppet and, um, and, you know, we're shooting it with a hidden camera and like, I knew that was a good idea, but it was really half an idea because I called it fun with Phil. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, we introduced this guy, Phil, who we can cast and, you know, we send him around and, and Dave feeds him lines through an earpiece. Um, and I was cast as Phil, um, not because I wrote it for myself. No. I didn't write it thinking I'd be cast. Um, but I think there was something about my kind of quiet hangdog uh, persona that got me cast. And then um, it wasn't until I'm pretty sure the day we were going to shoot it that the word came down that... Dave had second thoughts and wants to cast Rupert, which I think the first step of that was we need to cast somebody. We can't, it seems awkward and weird to introduce this, not even real per like my name isn't Phil, you know, yeah. like who is this guy? Why is it him? You yeah. know, the audience doesn't know who this guy is. So let's do it with somebody the audience knows. And then by that point, the audience knew Rupert very well. And it felt like he'd be a good fit for the, the construct. And so he was cast. Um, and I think it was, uh, you know, the director's idea to um, put the glasses with the, the camera in the bridge of the glasses on him so you could get the POV shots. Um, and the, the actual material of the piece, you know, I contributed to, but um, much of it was, generated by the writers and by Dave himself, um, you know, on the fly. Uh, you know, I've, I've had comedy writers, I remember say to me over the years that, um, that they wish they could have the, the raw footage from that piece because um, it was probably the best example of just Dave as uh, an improviser that exists on tape because it would go on for hours. Yeah. And he'd be improvising and, and much of it would be um, just really great. I mean, we, we had more than enough for the pieces that we, we used, you know, um, mm -hmm. it was just a very fruitful use of his abilities, uh, you know, to come up with kind of characterizations off the top of his head and entire backstories for, <laughs> for who Rupert was and names and, agendas and and then when we got leonard tepper involved it like <laughs> it kind of cubed itself in its levels of insanity because dave would be improvising conversation he it was only him feeding yeah. lines to both rupert and leonard who if people remember was kind of a, a an actor that we discovered and used in some bits who kind of resembled almost like a a 1930s like strong man from a you know some like a you know like f f weird new york comedy of the day or something he was just a a very odd looking and sounding guy and um Veronica. <laughs> yeah and so so we'd have you know obviously most of the comedy of fun with rupert was what are civilian is going to say and react to, you know, to this crazy person, but it evolved to a point where we'd have David, you know, uh, Rupert and Leonard would be sitting across from each other at an outdoor uh, cafe, outdoor seating, facing each other, both wearing the backpacks that contain the equipment and the glasses that contain the hidden camera. And Dave would just be feeding them lines to have a conversation with each other, no matter if anyone 
was even listening. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was kind of just like Dave improvising both parts of an extremely bizarre conversation you might overhear on the streets of New York City. And we would air this stuff. And it was it was fantastic. It was some of the funniest stuff that, in my opinion, was ever on the show. It was just, you know, Rupert and Leonard as these almost like Midnight Cowboy-esque duo of, you know, guys in, in Manhattan um, just... <laughs> just having lunch together it's uh oh god it was so fun it was so great um so uh, you're, you're I, right I, I asked the chronology oh. uh, go ahead I was say that, uh, you're right about the the, the sequence uh fun okay. with the car phone was in september 93 and the first fun with rupert was a year later uh december 94 yeah there you go okay yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, that sounds right to me um, <clears throat> because I, I, you know, there's the initial, that's the other part too, you know, Rupert appeared early on uh, with meet mm -hmm. the neighbors and, and, and you guys used him in other ways. Uh, so right. he was established on the show already. And, and I remember that. And then suddenly it's like, okay, now we're taking Rupert up to a next level. Like we're, 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 <laughs> we're, we're right. adding, adding fuel to that, uh, uh, you know, rocket fuel to that. Um, yeah. safe to say you were in the van for most of those, uh, most of those, uh, yeah, segments? I, yeah. Yes. I, I went out, uh, for a bunch of those and then other people started, um, doing them too. Um, but I, I did several of them and edited, uh, several of them, which was, you kind edited of a several of, the of them. Wow. Well yeah, done, sir. That, well done. Oh, thank you. That's, I mean, that's tremendous. You know, with plenty of help from Rob and Dave, I should say, but that was that was a bear of a job because just you, you had hours and hours of footage, and you had to synchronize all the you know Dave in the in the van feeding yep. lines, and then and the Rupert POV, and like I'd never had an undertaking like that before. Um, yeah, and, and just then to the get astonished the look, and... Rupert saying his thing, and then the astonished <laughs> look of the person, and and the way that you guys would do it had that quick cut. In my opinion, uh, yeah, it's some of the greatest comedy editing ever. Was 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 stuff in that seg those segments. So for your part in that, congratulations on that. I need well, to ask. And, if and I should say, when yes, I sir. say I edited them, I I'm using the wrong words because okay, obviously we had professional editors, of and course. I was not the person sitting at the uh, at the, the avid at the avid or at the yeah. time the precursor to that. Um, you know, very highly skilled editors like Mark Spada were actually doing that work, but I was um, supervising it as a producer and writer and, right. um, and that's really, I should have said producing the bits, okay. um, not editing them because I, I didn't. Um, All credit to those, uh, those guys and gals. Like, again, that is just an extremely well uh, put together piece from, yeah. like you said, combed through from hours of footage. Rupert's told us about the hours and hours and hours each one. Oh, yeah. To break yeah. it down, and and um, it's fun talking to the to to the writers, um, particularly on Late Show, where extras became a thing where you learned how to become uh, a producer of a little mini show because you were a part right. of every single part of the process. With, of course, uh, a small crew that was with you too. You know, micro compared to a, an entire production, but really, this it's just scale. It's the same kind of process um, mm -hmm. in in doing that. I need to ask, there's a specific one, in my opinion, the greatest uh, the greatest Letterman bit that never existed, but could have existed, happened in LA. And uh, I don't know if you know where I'm coming, coming with this, but there was a time where Rupert was in the van in LA and he was in the other van and, and there was a whole bunch of conversation going on and they were outside of a shoot somewhere looking at another shoot happening. And there was a decision that was made, no, we're not gonna take part in this. The shoot that was happening was Jay Leno was doing something over there. And it was a consideration if we're going to send Rupert to go bother Jay Leno and you guys decided not to do it. Were you in the van for that shoot? I don't think I was. Okay. Ah, I, uh, I feel bad, but I, I don't remember that. No, don't feel I bad. Don't I'm just looking. That. I'm, I'm <laughs> the one guy who I know was in the van won't come on the damn show. And that's Mr. Walter Kim. Uh, you know, and I say that jovially and, and happily. I love Walter. Uh, I know he was in the van. I want to know about that moment very much because I want to know yeah. about the consideration. Did you hear about that? I don't remember. Okay. I, I just don't remember. It's, uh, 
man, I don't have the best memory in the best no, no, of no. times. And that, that's... that was, I don't, I just don't remember. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, pretty funny though. We should have done it. It would have been great. <laughs> hindsight being 2020. Absolutely. Um, you know, but at the time, when you think about the time and, 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 and uh, the culture of the show and everything that was happening between both shows, you can certainly mm -hmm. see why it would be a debate and, and, and you can understand right. why the decision is made, but from a pure entertainment standpoint, um, boy, what a, what a thing that could have been. Yeah. Um, so, and, 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 and uh, this is where I want to, Oh, what do we got here? You kind of froze up a no, little no, bit, Don. I, can you show it again? I thought you, I thought you were finished. I, I don't want to butt in. No, um, no, no. Which of course, yeah. There he this is. is Leonard's There's Leonard. Yeah. Uh, oh, on late night, crazy. He was part of a top 10 in, Mar in Meg Parson's office. Oh, my this God. October of so 91. Funny. That's yeah. amazing. That's amazing. Um, now that you've said that, Don, there's a whole bunch of people that have been asking me if we can get Meg on the show. I have actually tried. Um, I'm going to try again. I'm going to give it in, in 24. I'm going to try and, and reach out to her to get her on the show. That would be a. Again, you know, these are the, some of those seminal moments that made um, that the building blocks of 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 what late night and late show were. Um, okay, you do, don't don't mention my name. Whatever you do. Okay, all right, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> okay. The uh, oh, okay. At, at this time, John, you know, you you yeah. you're in. You know, talking about the culture between um, you know a uh, uh, late show and the Tonight Show at that point. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the changes that have happened, you know, Morty leaving that sort of thing, worldwide pants now becoming a thing. Mm -hmm. At what point did your job, and then never mind head writer. I mean, I, I, you know, we haven't even got to that. Oh my God. I can't believe we're almost two hours. We haven't got to that yet. Um, I'm having yeah. fun. I hope you're having some fun doing this. Oh and, yeah. And no, it's great. It's great. You excellent. Go as long as you want to go. Keep going. Excellent. Um, so, so when does head writer happen? And I mean, you know, uh, and, and then moving so, over to Worldwide Pants, that's the part I want to. Right. So Head Writer happens because um, Rob is asked to uh, or, you know, is interested in uh, developing uh, a sitcom with Bonnie Hunt, who was, yeah. you know, a good friend of the show and um, a Worldwide Pants production. And you know, which is a huge opportunity for him. Uh, he's put in a couple of years as head writer, which is a long time to do that job. And I say that knowing there are people who've done it many multiples of two years. Mm -hmm. um, it's still a long time to do that job. And especially at the level at which he had done it, you know, the the whole transition uh, from 1230 to 1130 and, you know, launching the show as a massive hit. Um, so he got that opportunity and decided to take it and had to pass the baton. And the decision was made to, uh, to have it be me and Donick to do it together. And, um, uh, you know, Rob had evolved a very close relationship working relationship with Dave that neither Don Donick nor I had. Mm -hmm. um, Rob was, uh, was in his thirties. We were in our, you know, mid twenties. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it wasn't fun. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. I yeah. think, you know, we, we, we certainly wanted to succeed and, and put everything we had into it. Um, but uh, for whatever reason, I mean, I, I got to the point where I simply couldn't um, do it anymore. Yeah. And uh, I think after like a year or so, something like that, maybe a little more, um, and I, I said so, and, you know, felt bad about sort of, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to say abandoning Donick, but I, I just felt like I just didn't want to do this anymore. And so I, I 
stopped doing it and, you know, continued on as a writer, which mm -hmm. I still wanted to be. And Donick finished out the term and then left the show uh, and moved to LA and, you know, continued on with what has been a spectacular uh, career and, you know, including like the Simpsons and, mm -hmm. you know, creating stuff and, uh, you know, all kinds of things. And uh, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, look, all I'm going to say is um, either at that point in my life, I wasn't entirely up to the task Dave wasn't entirely up opened to the uh, scenario mm -hmm. or some combination of the two, but uh, that was that was about as low as I've been kind of emotionally, maybe in my life. Uh, I was at a very bad place from having done that for a year. Um, so what happened was uh, when Donick left, it was like, well, they're going to have to find someone else. Now, in the meantime, I should add, I think, so one day I'm minding my own business uh, in the writer's office and Rob calls up and says, I've left the Bonnie Hunt show. That hasn't worked out. And, um, and I want to know if you'd be interested in developing a show with me because you know, by that point, we had collaborated a lot. Um, and I guess he, you know, thought of me as somebody he'd like to work with, uh, which is very flattering. And, and I said, you know, yeah, I'd love to do that. And so that's when the development process for Ed began. Now, in the meantime, um, uh, you know what? Wait, no, I, I did. I have this right. Okay, this yes, this is all accurate. Okay. So <laughs> everything I've said so far has been correct. So <laughs> the next thing that happens is um, Joe Toplin, who had been a, a very highly regarded writer on NBC, came in and um, and took the head writer position. Yep. And... I started developing Ed with Rob. So that became like my job. Um, you Were know, you still writing for Letterman the, at all at this point? I may have been very marginally, but not really. Um, still working out of your office at the Ed though? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I, I think I was moved to a different office on a different floor, um, yep. like a development office. Like a pants office and, as opposed to a late show yeah. office. Yeah. 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 And, and Rob and I would, um, you know, we were starting from square one of what kind of show we wanted to do and that the development process of that show was very unusual, but that's what I was doing. And then several months into that, um, Rob says, Johnny, let's take a walk. <laughs> and I'm like, what's this going to be? And he explains to me that, something very big is happening, which is that uh, Dave has asked Rob to replace Morty as EP of, uh, of the show of, oh. of the, of late show. Um, and, you know, and I don't remember or know how much it was also about taking the helm of pants, you know, and all of that side of it. But it was like, Dave wants me to run the late show. So I'm not going to be able to do, you know, a primetime series with you at this time. Um, we can do it later, but it's not going to happen right now. Uh, and I would really like you to be my head writer um, while I'm doing this. And, and so this was a job that, as I said, had, been very unpleasant for me yep. um and but i really wanted to develop a show with rob and so i i said and again i know i'm sounding probably privileged and unappreciative of of opportunities i was offered Absolutely who wouldn't want to be not. the head writer of, of yeah. a 
of a big hit comedy show, but some things you learn just aren't for you. Um, yes. And I, but I said, yes, I said, I'd do it for a year. And, um, and so I did. And uh, was it easier the second time than it was the first time? Mm, I think it was easier in some ways. I think it was easier to do it myself rather than with Donick, not in any way because Donick isn't amazing, but I think there's some jobs that are best held by one person. Yep. And when it's just you, like, I don't know, you just, it's more manageable to my brain when it's just me and, and I've got to get it done. Um, the rapport with Rob certainly helped as well, right? That couldn't have been a, that was a tool that you didn't necessarily have in the same way before. That's true. I, yes, I think, I think it was, um, I think it was a boon that Rob was there because like the first, the first time Donick and I had been head writer together, it was like Dave's right hand man had left the building. And it was like, now there's these two punks. And, you know, at least when I was doing it for this, my second stint, uh, Rob was there, you know? And so Dave was comfortable with having his guy there. And uh, I um, still didn't like that. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> that, yeah. that was a you're show not writing as much. much like you're you're, yeah. you're 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 making sure the stuff that comes in fits the sensibility of the show and you're piecing it and all the all these other moving parts when this is a mm -hmm. lampoon kid who loves to write and you're now not getting a chance to write the way that you were and you have all these other things that you're not necessarily yeah. wired for right like it's a different I like gig. to sit it, it, it is i like to sit in a room by myself or with another couple people yeah and have a you know, an hours long conversation that eventually develops into a great idea. I like to sit at a computer and know that in an hour I need to hand in a bunch of top tens and see if they can be the best, you know, I'm capable of doing. Yeah. I don't like looking at a calendar and thinking about, oh, if we want to do, um, you know, a wacky props piece three weeks from now, I have to assign it today and I have to get it to, you know, the art department, you know, on Monday. I hate having to think about stuff like that. Yeah. I, you know, on any job I've had since then, and I probably could have done this better at the time, but I didn't have the tools to know this. Yeah. I would have delegated that. I would have said to somebody, you know what? I want to do wacky props at some point. It's your job to figure out yeah. how to implement that on, on the schedule. But I don't You're think my organizational was... czar. Here you go. I don't want to yeah. think about it. Yeah. 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 And I didn't have that. And maybe it's just part of the way, you know, everyone's brains are different. I don't have that capability. Um, I'm also. So you could delegate. Right. But I didn't know that. And nobody told me that. And I didn't have the maturity or tools to realize it and to stand up and say, I need somebody to do this for me. Um, I also, uh, you know, I mean, I think I had a certain rapport with Dave, but it wasn't what Rob had and who knows why. Um, but, you know, I remember going out on a remote with him early in my time there and he asked me how old I was. And I said, 23. And he said, I'm 46. I'm twice your age. And <clears throat> 23 year gap, that's a lot. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, and, and younger people than me went on to be the head writer. And, you know, what can I tell you? I just, I, um, I think I, you know, I was probably just, uh, I didn't have the confidence that I probably should have had at that age to do that job. I, um, you know, I felt I was stepping into not just the shoes of Rob, but the shoes of people like Steve O'Donnell and Meryl Marco, who, you know, I considered Giant. just incredibly brilliant, you know, 
yeah, like legends. Yeah. And uh, uh, I, I'd be far better to do that job today than I was then, but I would never do it today. <laughs> um, uh, Smart enough yeah, to know better. I, yeah. Yeah. I think I just, you know, Joe, there were... Joe Grossman. What, what about Joe? Oh, no. Well, he, I'm sorry. Um, Joe had, had said to Mike on, on one of his conversations that early on, on late night, Dave's writers were maybe a couple years younger than him. Yeah. Uh, Jerry right. was a couple years older than him. They were peers. That's right. They were more peers. And that's right. And the age of the writers remained constant while Dave got older. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely correct. So, uh, and so, I, I think it figures into yeah, and, and, how things evolved over the years on that show. Um, it's funny. I've been. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I've been watching a lot of Larry Sanders lately and, uh, you know, which I watched back in the day, but I, I don't know why, but something got me to just start kind of binging it, uh, yeah. for fun. And what I noticed about the show, you know, much of it, uh, uh, is kind of in some ways true to my experience working at in late night, but the thing that never resonated with me on that show then or now is that the staff is not afraid of Larry. The staff is just talking to Larry like he's he's one of them in a yeah. way. Like yeah. staffers at all levels, they're, yeah. they're, they're not afraid of him. Yeah. They're not like, uh, you know, they're, they sometimes kind of are critical of him. They, you know, they zing him or they mouth off to him or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm, there may be shows where that's the case, but this was not one of those shows, you know, and some of it may have owed to the fact that I was, he was literally twice my age, you know? Yeah. So it wasn't like I was having a beer with the guy. Mm -hmm. It just like, you know, it just wasn't that at all, you know? Um, uh, so yeah, I forgot what question I was answering, but, but yes, <laughs> I did. I did it twice. I think it probably was a bit easier the second time. Yep. Um, Actually, and there's then... a third time. There's a third time back in, at further on to 98, where you and Rob are sharing the, or at least the closing credits state that you and Rob were sharing the uh, head writer credits. I don't even know what that was. <laughs> yeah, I don't even and know what that the, was. Probably a transition see, see, back period on or something. Like, Get back on late you know night, the closing crawl. Here, if I had to guess, I'd say oh, what, sorry, what that was mm -hmm. with me and Rob is I bet what that was was um, we were probably – it was probably at the point where I had been told you can – are now fully resume just development for Worldwide Pants. But Rob probably was like, listen, I kind of need, need to – you to hang in there for a few months and kind of juggle a couple balls here and I'll do it with you. So like you, you won't feel like it's just on you for that time. We'll do it together and then we'll be done. And I think that's what that, I think that's the explanation for that. I think that's what happened there. The, the more I'm looking at it, 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 it may be even more simplified than that because that the, the, the show where you and Rob shared head writer credits along with Rodney, uh, was on the primetime special, the fourth primetime special. Oh, so it was, well, uh, that's it was a an even simpler explanation. A, yeah. Okay. Um, you know what, 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 and this goes back to what I didn't realize was that Ed was a good four years gestation. It, it yeah. was nearly that. It was yeah. nearly that. Uh, it started in 2000, in right? Fact, 2000. But you know what, Don, about? I think, I think the first um, the first script with a date on it could have been as early as ninety six. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because we we worked on it for a little while. At that point, it was a half hour, um, and then we got you know pulled out of it to uh, go back to running late show, and then we got back into it. Um, you know, did a whole development 
season with CBS. Uh, they shot, they made the pilot, but then passed on putting it on the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, NBC executives saw it and liked it and asked us to redevelop it with them. Um, with the same cast who luckily were available. And that was the point at which, uh, so the CBS pilot was simply a guy, a guy's whole life collapses in a day and he moves uh, or he goes back to his hometown on kind of a drunken inspired quest to ask out the girl he never had the guts to ask out in high school and kind of restart his life by doing so. And, um, and, you know, when she doesn't completely uh, reject him, he's so excited that he buys the local bowling alley that, that he had, you know, gone to as a kid um, and decides to move there. Sounds a little stalkery from a 2023 point, 2024 <laughs> point of view, but uh, what, what can I say? Um, that was the, the CBS version. When NBC wanted to redevelop it with us, they said, uh, you're going to need to add a franchise, which is the kind of showbiz term for uh, jobs like you know, lawyer, doctor, yeah. things where you can have a case of the week structure. Mm -hmm. And I remember Rob and I sitting down making a list of every job, <laughs> just every job people have, you know, and deciding that lawyer was the right kind of job for this character in this town. And uh, one of the executives at the time, uh, Scott Sassa, he was the guy who was like, he should put his office right in the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. And we're like, huh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And uh, so I have to credit him for that. And that's what the tagline for the show always, what everyone who knew the show, oh, the bowling alley lawyer show. Yeah, okay. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And uh, and so we added that element where he could, um, you know, help the different quirky townsfolk with their legal issues. <laughs> Yeah. And uh um and that was the version that ended up um airing on NBC and going for four seasons. I got to ask about that. David Letterman is this is the the, the, the we've had uh, George Schweister on the show before uh, and 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 I mean I want to get some other CBS executives. I'm working on that, but but, mm -hmm. but but George did a really good job talking about how um you know, it, this is a historic thing. David Letterman, the signature star of of of, of CBS um and 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 the the disappointment that must have been felt um, at certain levels of CBS passing on this show, NBC picking up this show. NBC has now got a worldwide pants show on. Uh, yeah. People make fun of CBS for what are you doing? You're not picking up the show. If uh, you know you one of your your CBS signature stars, uh, did that disappointment or ridicule or 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 any of those feelings that came with that reach your level? Here's here's how I look at that. First of all, I think one of the reasons NBC wanted the show is because they liked the idea of having the guys from Letterman do a show for them instead of CBS. I think they, you know, I think that appealed to them as Littlefield kind of liked that idea. Warren Littlefield liked that idea. Guys like that. Well, it was Jeff Zucker and Scott Sasa. Okay. And I think okay. they like they liked the idea. Um, I mean, they wouldn't have done it if they didn't see something in the show and in Absolutely. Tom Cavanaugh and, the, and Julie Bowen and the other people we had on the show. Um, but they uh, they liked that idea. The second thing I'll say is that, you know, I always tell people like kind of younger than me in the business and whatever that – like there are there are times in your career when the wind is blowing at your back and there are times where you're trying to walk into the wind mm -hmm. and when you see someone succeeding if you've been around a while you know that part of it is their merit and part of it is that the wind is blowing on their back in some way you're not aware of most yep. likely yeah right at the time that i did ed I was a 20-something guy who had never worked 
on a sitcom or on an hour long dramedy or on a legal show or on a show shot on film or any of these things, mm-hmm. I was a talk show writer, right? Um, Rob had marginal experience outside of being a very successful late night talk show writer. Mm-hmm. The fact that um, we even got to develop uh, a primetime comedy for CBS was because the wind was blowing at our backs. We were two of the value people at one of the hottest things the network had going. Mm-hmm. We were the guys. I mean, not to take away from our achievement, you know, nope. Rob had masterminded the transition to, uh, you know, the writing, the new show. I was by his side for that. Yep. And, um, but suffice it to say, like, there's reason to think that they only ordered it to please Dave, not because they thought, oh, this will be a hit for our network, you know? Yeah. Um, it was not the type of show that was, you know, usually developed or usually put on the air. Yeah. Um, and I kind of feel like it was this thing where, like, yeah, you know, we made this deal with World Wide Pants. They brought us a, a, you know, piece of material. We'll buy it. We'll mm-hmm. even go as far as to let them shoot it but we're not putting this on the air, you know, like it's not, it just wasn't suited for their air. Yeah. Um, And some of that, by the way, they may have been absolutely right about, like I said, it didn't, he wasn't a lawyer. It, it might not have, they may have been absolutely right to not do it, but I think it only got as far as it got because of the circumstances around it. The wind was at our backs. Yeah. And, and, you know, the fact that I that I had a uh, created by you know co-created by and shared uh, EP credit on literally the first primetime series I ever worked on is absurd. Yes, and I was the wind at my back guy at that point that other people must have looked at and been like, "What is this about?" In the meantime. I didn't have any of the training to do Mm -hmm. that job. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I didn't, I'd never done it before, you know, and I, I had to learn to do it on the job. And uh, so, you know, again, not sure what question I'm answering. Uh, No, no, no. But I gotta, I'm, I'm going to, this is where I jump in and talk about the charming uh, self-deprecation that that comes in. There's steak and sizzle. You're talking about the sizzle got you to that place, but the show is Mm -hmm. the steak. The the reason that we keep asking oh, and people yeah. have been asking for years about the show, like the show was fantastic, and and, oh, and it thanks. lasted for four, it lasted for four seasons. That's yeah. nothing to sneeze it at. It did exactly. You're yeah. right. You're right. And I, God, yeah, I, um, you know, I wish I had enjoyed it more while it was happening because, uh, <laughs> yeah, and you got Burt Reynolds. <laughs> we got Burt Reynolds, man. I. <laughs> Yeah, Burt Reynolds. I, I have to tell a quick side story, which is that um, so that the point. Rob and I, <laughs> Rob and I loved uh, Burt Reynolds just from you know uh, being Gen Xers, and uh, yep. you know you love Burt Reynolds. He was Absolutely. like he was the greatest, and and so we were casting. Uh, you know, we had our character Mike played by Josh Randall, who was Ed's best friend, and we mm-hmm. decided to do a storyline with um, with Mike's dad. And so, you know, you are always encouraged to stunt cast things. Sometimes you want to, sometimes it'd be fun to, you know, bring in somebody that's amazing. Like we had gotten to stunt cast uh, John Goodman and, you know, a bunch of other people. And we, uh, and so, yeah, the idea of Bert came up and he said, yes. And suddenly (laughs) there we are on set with Bert Reynolds and had our picture take. I mean, we just couldn't believe Burt Reynolds was on our show. And <laughs> but the story is that Bert uh, Bert's character was supposed to like kind of do that to Mike's cheek, like you know, like kind of condescending, yeah, you know, face slap. Bert slapped Josh with all the strength in his body. <laughs> And he did it on every take. And and Josh, I, Rob and I were not on set for this, I don't think, because I, I think we would have had to intervene and we weren't informed of this. But 
it got back to us that Josh was getting angrier and angrier. And it sort of was this thing of like, am I going to tell Burt Reynolds to ease off? Does that, it was like some kind of alpha thing, but Josh had this just like, I mean, this is a horrible story, but it's also funny, I guess, but it was like, it was something in Bert that like he, he had to do this to Josh and see if Josh could roll with it, which I guess, I guess Josh did, but how crazy is that? It's like, there were, I don't think there was a stunt man on set for the day because we didn't think we were doing a stunt. We thought we were doing this. And yeah, I, I don't know if I told that to anybody publicly before I, but, uh, God, God rest Burt Reynolds for he was a maniac, old school. <laughs> yeah, he was he he was that. Um, uh, I hate I hate that yeah. we have to move. I hate that we have to move toward the end of this. Um, That's okay. Uh, okay, so so I feel like we've jumped through a few hoops here. You've had mm -hmm. fun, right, John? Like I've had an absolute blast yeah. talking to you about this stuff. Um, yeah. If we can redesign a way that will entice you to come back, will you come back? Can we figure out something wh that we can have you back in a future episode yeah. to talk about some more stuff? Yes. Would you say no? Because I'm asking you right now with the camera on. I, no, this has been a blast. Like it really is. Um, can I ask you about your t-shirt real quick? Oh, I did you custom make that? You guys. Did you? No. Okay. I, uh, this shirt, I just happened to see, um, I think online at some point and it was go. for sale and I, I bought it. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. It's great. I don't know if that um, would have been a, a Carson shot or not. Um, but anyway, it was in the opening crawl of, of, of late night. Um, it was, it was a video. So it was, it was unlikely marks. Yeah. Right. Well, there you go. That's absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. right. Um, that's so anyway, uh, uh, I want to finish off a little bit, uh, just real quick, uh, asking you about what it is that you're, what you're doing. That part doesn't have to be quick. Um, and then I've got a little teeny tiny anecdote that O'Donnell gave me. And I want to go back to that moment of the, 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 okay. the, the part before head writer, before all the moving over all that stuff sure, about the sure, writer sure. room. Um, but I want to know about what you're doing now and some of the projects originally when I, when I, when I reached out to you, uh, London, right. Doing some stuff. I was in England heading and... off to London. Yeah. yeah. I, um, yeah, so um you know, so I I've, I've spent the last uh several years in LA, uh, you know, developing uh many projects for uh uh different networks and you know, the way the way one does. Mm -hmm. And um uh and I you know, I I, I have one that's going to be on TV. So that's, that's, uh, that's the big news, which is great. Um, so this show is called uh, dinner with the parents and it's um, there's a show uh, that was on for uh, several years, uh, series, not seasons as they call them over there. Mm. Um, uh they say like the first series, the second series. I don't yep. know why they, they do that, but um, it's called Friday night dinner. It was created by a brilliant guy named Robert Popper. And you might be able to see it on a streamer um, here now. I'm not, you know, things come and go. I don't mm -hmm. know, but, um, but it Who's was a show. What's that? I didn't hear Don. Sorry. Did you say something? A blues traveler. That was Blues Traveler. What? I don't understand yeah. the reference. Popper. Oh, John Popper. Oh, Popper. That's where it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Don. Yeah. Normally I'm quicker and I would have got that. Yeah. 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 It's always <laughs> funny when you have to explain it. Um, yeah, that's right. I have met both Poppers because I, <laughs> I, I got to meet John back in the 90s uh, when he was on the Letterman show and yeah. hang out with him. And uh, then many years later, uh, the great Robert Popper, who... Um, yeah, he's one of you know the top comedy guys um, over there in the UK, and he created a show, uh, you know, kind of based on his family, in which um, the the sort of uh, construct is of it is that every Friday night, uh, this mom and dad's two <clears throat> uh, young adult sons come over for uh, Shabbat dinner. 
and the you know it's very farcical so it's it's not it's not like oh they all sit at the table and talk about what happened to them that week and you see flashbacks it's none of that it's just they all meet for dinner and things go you know absurdly wrong for all sorts of reasons because they're all maniacs and that you know they all uh, uh <laughs> make terrible choices yeah. and and there had been some attempts to uh develop it for american television that had not gone all the way um but a lot of people still seem to believe that there was no reason why this couldn't work as an american show mm -hmm. and uh and at some point i was looking for something to do and um uh kate adler and alec botnick uh at cbs studios had you know the rights to do this and um and asked me if i wanted to take a shot at it and i looked at the show <clears throat> and i i felt that the family was you know had a lot of of similarities to mine just in its, you know, a, a mom, a dad, two brothers yep. uh, who are, you know, kind of jokers. And, um, and so I took, I took my version of it out uh, and, you know, long story short, it's going to be on Amazon uh, this year. Um, and it's now called dinner with the parents Yep. Sorry, I'm losing my voice after all these hours doing this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's um, it's something I'm I'm enormously uh, proud of and excited to get out in front of people. Uh, I don't know if you'll know these names, but um, the stars include uh, Michaela Watkins, Dan Bacadal, uh Carol Kane, um. A guy who's huge on YouTube named uh, Daniel Thrasher is one of the brothers. Yeah. Uh, Henry Hall, uh, who is uh, equally fantastic and uh, more of a newcomer and plays the other brother. And um, uh, John Glazer, who people who love Late Night might yeah. know from Conan, uh, but yeah. who's also done other many hilarious things uh, as their neighbor. Um so always got to be a wacky cast, neighbor right yes uh and he is that and uh <laughs> we also had the delight of having uh rob delaney guest as a different neighbor on a couple episodes uh and be phenomenal um and many hilarious uh english actors because we we shot the show um outside of london yeah. uh and um you know, we all flew over there and did it for four months. And, uh, you know, I have many stories to tell from that, but, but maybe, maybe once the show premieres, we can well, uh, talk about it. Yeah. We um, just created a natural point to when the show premieres that we'll, 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 we'll do then uh, a, a very cool kind of deep dive for everything that you can say at that point. When is the show premiering? Um, I haven't been given an official date okay. yet, but, but 24 would... though, it'll be in 24. It'll be in, uh, well, God willing, it'll be in 24. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. How, many episodes? How many episodes? There's 10 of them. 10, uh, roughly half hour episodes. <clears throat> and Congratulations. Will they all, will they all come Thank out at you. the same time or scattered? Um, I don't know, know yet. yet. Uh, yeah. No, I don't know yet. I was talking to Chris I Harris. Think, and uh, you couldn't get Hugh Laurie. I, I, I love I love what they did with Frasier. I love that they released them one yeah, week. Yeah, isn't it great? It's oh, so yeah. great. The and show itself, but also the fact that they didn't just throw the whole season on us where 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 my wife and I could because we would have inhaled it in a weekend. And and I am so grateful to the fact that that they made us wait for it. There were a couple episodes like mm -hmm. back in the day we watch it twice uh, um, in between and 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 it was such so rich and so good. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but whether or not, I can't wait to watch it just to support what you're doing too. But it sounds like, it sounds like it's going to be really uh, a, a great piece of entertainment that you've made. Congratulations on that! It feel good I to finish so. it. Feel good to to see it to fruition like that. Oh yeah, I mean, it uh, for me it was very satisfying. Um, <clears throat> I 
I loved the whole prospect, uh, process of doing it from beginning to end. And, uh, the people I got to work with, including, uh, Tristram Shapiro, uh, Storad Kakar, who's one of the, uh, British producers of the show, Kenton Allen, um, Gina Lyons, uh, you know, it was great having, making a new family, um, over, uh, in England and, um, uh, and the cast I adore and I, I just, I'm excited for people to see it because, um, you know, I, I, I was really left alone. Uh, not that, you know, the network and studio don't have their input. They do. And it, it was very helpful, but I, there wasn't anything I wanted to do that I couldn't do. Um, awesome. and the actors were able to take everything, uh, I threw at them and make it, uh, so much better. Um, and the writers were, uh, really terrific and great to work with. So yes, this is, this is, um, look for whatever reason, maybe it's my, um, my advanced age and my, uh, depth of experience but it's i can't complain about this one <laughs> i no. would i would love to do it again and i hope i get to um and uh are, are, yeah it was great i hope you do it all, oh go ahead are, are the characters all british you mentioned carol kane i mean, I mean um, do they, are, are, are they are they acting they're as not british? No, they're not. They're acting as American, <clears throat> which is what they are. Um, yeah. So it's like, it's very simply, um, what if, you know, a typical American family got to dinner, uh, got together for dinner every Friday night and things went, you know, horribly wrong. Uh, that's, that's what it is. Um, and why we shot it in England, you know, maybe will someday be explained to me, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but, but the show, um, the show takes place in America and with the exception of some of our lovely guest cast who yeah. we couldn't fly in just to do, you know, uh, a single scene. Um, uh, uh, the cast is American. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, got to work with a lot of, uh, English character actors who would be very well known to, uh, you know, English viewers and maybe less so to American ones, which is fun. Um, that is fantastic. Um, I'm, we're about to turn into a pumpkin here. The, 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 okay. the system is going to shut down. So I have to, I have to close her off. Um, John, you have been spectacular. I thank you so, so much. Thank for coming for on the Letterman podcast. Are you kidding me? This has been such a, a pleasure and an honor to have had you here. Um, I just appreciate you for, 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 for how thoughtful you have been uh, throughout this whole process, but also uh, I thank you so much for contributing to this body of work that we care about so, so much and being such a big uh, contributor to that. Thank you so well, much, John. I appreciate how much you care about it because it's nice to have somebody care about, you know, the, the work that you put some of your um, best and, you know, uh, most productive time into. So yeah, yeah, thank you for caring. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's been great. I, was, I can't I was, wait to have you back and, and give, so, give our best to Rob Burnett. I was going to say this, wait, what camera, was... but I don't think it's going to be possible. Oh, what was that done? I was, Don's I, was I was going to say this off camera, but oh, okay, yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to say this off camera, but I don't think that's going to be possible. Uh, thank you for you know what. You're welcome, Don. I do know what, and look, you, uh, you know, you, you don't have say, to no, no, you because stop right I, there. Okay, um, <laughs> but I do, I do want to hear what Steve O'Donnell said about me. What happened to that? Oh, you yeah. know what? No, uh, okay. It was, it was, a. Uh, 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 he talked about how you were, you got to see the best of the writer's room and he, he referenced uh -huh. a couple of things about uh hot potato, um, um, oyster eating <laughs> contests. Um, some of the things that yeah. were, that were there. And, and that was the, um, tub you know, of tea comes to mind. Tub there we go. Of tea. Yes. We would get a uh, delivery from a Chinese restaurant. And if you ordered tea, it would come in, 
you know, a delivery container, meaning a plastic tub with a lid snapped onto it as if yeah. it were, you know, fried rice or whatever. <clears throat> and it'd be this boiling hot tub of tea. And there, there was a thing where everyone would chant tub of tea and you would have to drink this just punishingly <laughs> hot liquid that was just cooking you from <laughs> the inside out. Um, yeah, there was a bunch of stuff like that. It was, it was a really fun room. I, you know, it was, uh, as it was at the time, a, a largely male and extremely white room, mm -hmm. which I think was to the, the deficit of the show. But, um, but it was nevertheless, um, you know, I, we've talked about many of the people and some we, we haven't gotten around to, like yeah. Steve Young, we haven't really discussed, uh, who's somebody I loved, but. Um, He's uh, been talked about him. <laughs> no, I know. I know he has. Next um, time. Jerry, Jerry, for God's sake. Uh, we had, had, um, it was, it was a great group of people to be part of. Uh, and I miss them. Um, you Is know, it I, as an equal or, or as a, a plebe? Well, I mean, you know, initially a plebe and then eventually, uh, I would hope an equal, I mean, Donick is, you know, pretty much mm -hmm. same age as me. Um, <clears throat> Spike just, you know, tiny bit older. Jill Davis is just a, a tiny bit older, I think. And um, uh, so, you know, it wasn't like I was like a little kid compared to many of them. Um, and I still see uh, Donick and Rodney quite regularly. Um, Rodney, I used to live in Venice here in LA and um, Rodney and his family moved to a house that was like a 40 second walk from ours. And mm. I've moved since then, but like for a while, you mm. know, we could just drop by each other's house and, <clears throat> and Donick is still a really good friend and Rob and uh, you know, all these years later. So um, as I said on the, the, uh, the Letterman channel, that's, that's really what I take away from that is there were just people I loved and admired um, so much and got to work with. And that's, that's what it's all about. Well, and today's episode uh, has been an expansion of that. Uh, tell all those three that they're all on my list. And uh, um, uh, this has been, uh, it's great to do this. One of the things that I want to do with this show is create some of these, like, like Steve uh, Young and Steve O'Donnell are going to be coming on at the same time. And we're going to be going through some stuff and, and reminiscing that way. And, 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 um, certainly I'll any of your, to that. yeah, any of your fraternity that we ever want to do that with any combinations of, uh, of, uh, you know, there's an open forum to do that. Um, and I'm happy to just help provide a structure for that. All of us as the folks who, um, adored what it was that you guys did, uh, will be, um, you know, a secondary, uh, recipient of this amazing, um, fraternity and, and resharing of these memories. Uh, John Beckerman, you are, you are a giant yourself, sir. Um, and I know that you will never think that, but there are many of us who do uh, believe that and, and are very, very grateful for your work. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on the Letterman podcast and to be just to, to be on here as long as you were. And, and this, it, this felt really, really good. Thank you so much, man. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. It's an, like I said, it's an honor to have anybody want to talk to me for a couple hours. I, I'm grateful. Um, and it was fun. Thanks, guys. Outstanding. Thank you, Don. Appreciate you as well. Uh, I'll do a real you quick can outro. Go. Mike and I, you can go. go. Ahead. John and I can keep on talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm going to do a quick outro. Um, this is why we do the show. Uh, this is exactly why we do the show. Um, so great talking with John about his tenure. Uh, in the productions of David Letterman and company. Uh, go to Hello-Deli, our one and only sponsor. Hello-Deli.com, your only source for official Late Show with David Letterman merchandise per, uh, packed with care by Rupert G. himself. Hello-Deli.com. And uh, this has been another episode of the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants. <laughs>